Good evening. This is the July 10th Public Safety Building Committee meeting. Uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Berry's on his way, and I believe Mr. Moorhead's also on his way, but in the interest of a packed agenda, I feel like we'll uh, get going given that we have a quorum present. Um, our first order of business, uh, Jerry from the school committee is here. Um, Jerry, I know we exchanged a few emails um, in terms of w why we wanted to speak, but just a general update. Um, our committee was formed within the last month. Um, as you know, at the town meeting, um, I think many people in the community view the successful passage of the project, not only to support the needs of our public safety professionals, but also the potential enhancements that could happen with the conservation restriction and maintaining a nine hole golf course, but also the benefits that it will have for purposes of recreation in the Woodward School. So with that in mind, um, the rest of our meeting tonight, we're gonna to be interviewing owners, project managers, but what we wanted to do sooner rather than later is tee up a discussion with your committee, um, and it may be that we come at a future time to your meeting, but of what you're planning to do, if anything, now that the town almost owns that adjacent property, and um, what we can do to work together to make sure that if you are gonna take any action, which will take some time, that we're working cohesively together to make sure that um, any synergies that can be had by any projects are realized. So. With that baseline, I don't know if you have any thoughts or? Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank all of you for the hard work and in, in the fantastic job that you did getting this done. And I'm speaking for myself. I mean, I've lived in town now 21 years. Um, this is a long time coming. Personally, I always supported this, and I was very, very happy to see it happen. So thank you all. Um, now, I've spoken to Christine Johnson, and I told her that I would come tonight. I said at this point, I didn't think that anybody at the school needed to come. The main concern um, that the school has, the main thing we'd like to see is a driveway coming out of the Woodward School so that it was a safer condition than it is today. Right now you go in as kind of a cul-de-sac and you kind of go out the same way. It's, it's, it's a one-way thing going in there. So I think that's the main thing the school would like to see, but um, we'd, we'd, uh, we're looking forward to working with you and making this a success over the next year or two, I think, you know, as we progress into the uh, construction. Do you envision yourself setting up any sort of subcommittee to, or whether, or maybe it's your full committee to examine how best to enhance that roadway and or be liaisons to our committee to kind of work cohesively together? Um, I think that we would, um, we would do whatever it takes and if it needs a subcommittee or if it were to be in front of the full committee, we'll do whatever it takes to make this a success. Okay. I mean, I don't know what our other committee members have to say, but I think you know the one thing that I would just point out is is there isn't necessarily funding right. associated with enhancements to the driveway. However, our goal is to have shovels in the ground next April. Um, it would obviously, given that you can't be doing roadway construction during a school year, yep. kind of just thinking ahead, um, the sooner rather than later that you can get a plan together and hopefully the equipment that hopefully is on the golf course moving earth to build a building can naturally just shift right next door to you know make this the most cost effective project yep. so i know at least personally I, I would advocate that your committee start to mobilize on this sooner rather than later so that we can work together because unfortunately we're not going to necessarily be looking for ways to enhance the the driveway given everything else we have in front of us but what we want to be able to do is say when we have a final s exact site um, and where every beam is going, we want to be able to say, yep, we can still accommodate everything that the school is looking to do for Woodward. That, that sounds good. We will you know, take action on this over the summer. We'll contact people, and y okay. you know, by September, we'll have a pretty good action plan. So. Okay. So we look forward to working with you, and if you uh, need anything from us, you know where to find us. Same here, and thank you, all of you, for all the hard work you've done. Thank you. Our intentions um, that when we ultimately get to the the blueprint stage, if you will, to have uh, designs incorporate this road work, or are, are we or are you looking to the school committee to come up with independent designs? Uh, my my preference would be the former. I, I don't know wh where we're going in that regard, though. I think design. We already have a schematic design that incorporates 
incorporates the enhancement to a driveway, uh, traffic flow, I think it would all have to be considered. One of the line items in our budget is a traffic study, right? right? Which not only encompasses the fire police apparatus, but it's also going to encompass just the traffic flow mm -hmm. around the field. So I think we would be involved in working hand in hand on design. I think where our we stop is any sort of funds to pave or move any sort of equipment on that site. Thank you. Any other comments from any of the committee members? Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for coming, Thank you, everybody. So our, our first scheduled interview is 6.15 because it is a um, posted time for to start time. We um, do not have, to, we, we have to wait till that 6.15 time slot. Um, advancing down on the agenda, uh, we didn't really have any further to-dos um, from the last meeting. And um, I believe the meeting minutes are still in process for that meeting. Um, there was obviously a lot to, to take in, and I know John uh, mentioned earlier that he's taken at least a first stab, but he wants to go back through the, the tape, et cetera, to make sure we have everything um, encompassed there, given the, the conversation back and forth. Um, with that being said, um, we do need to formally um, submit our evaluations from all seven um, to Mr. Purple by, by the conclusion of this process. So you don't need to submit them right this second, but um, I would anticipate when we go before the BOS um, next Tuesday night, um, everyone should have a full set of evaluations for all seven firms that submitted a proposal. Obviously, the four that we chose to bring forward tonight would have potentially uh, more robust commentary around it given the, the, the nature of the back and forth that, that is forthcoming. Is there any questions on, on any of that? there any other business that the committee wants to discuss outside of the OPM interviews that you want to take up now? Okay, then I'll make a motion we go into recess until 6.15. Second. All those in favor? We're in recess.
Good evening. So I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Uh, it is currently 6.15, um, and we're going to uh, begin with our first interview. Uh, just a brief outline of how we um, are planning to run the interview process, just for about uh, the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, we'll give you about five minutes to introduce yourselves, your firm, and anything else you think would be relevant for our team to uh, consider up here. Uh, our committee has studied at great length both your proposal as well as the proposals of the others that are coming before us tonight. Um, at that time, after the five minutes, um, I, myself as the chair will ask you about 15 minutes of uh, questions. Those same questions will be asked to all uh, firms uh, appearing before us. And then the remaining 25 minutes will be really for any committee member um, to ask questions based on anything that they heard in the first 20 minutes, sure. anything in your proposal, or anything we haven't covered uh, today. It will be very informal. Sure. I'll kind of direct the flow so we're not coming at you um, from all different angles. but. With that, <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Marks. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, my name is Richard Marks. With me is Alicia Monks. We represent Daedalus Projects, which is a construction project management firm based in Boston. We have 31 employees. We have five project managers, of whom Alicia and I are two. Uh, we have six in-house cost estimators, um, which is unique to our firm, that we have cost estimating as an in-house service. Um, and we have 14 on-site representatives. So those on-site representatives have traditionally been called clerks of the works. Today we expect more of them than a typical clerk of the works. So we call them on-site representatives. So they'll be on-site during construction for the entire period. Um, uh, among the project managers, Alicia is a registered architect and Tom Gatsunas is a uh, professional engineer, a PE. Um, so we have good qualifications in terms of uh, uh, of them especially. Uh, we've been doing this for over 20 years. We have a number of uh, police and fire facilities that we've built. We're currently uh, in design for a combined police fire facility in New Bedford. Um, we are just about complete with a combination fire and police facility in Sharon, which is under budget and will open in a month. And in Medfield, we also built a combined police fire. Alicia just finished uh, a police station in Salisbury very successfully. Um, which has been open, what, uh, two months now, roughly? Yeah, about two months. Um, and uh, she will be the designated project manager for this assignment. So that's, that's the quick overview. Uh, as we've said, uh, as you've said, you've, you've read our material, but we're happy to entertain the questions and comments that you have. Sure. So thank you. So um, our first question is, uh, in your proposal, you submitted an estimated timeline. Um, most notably, just for those that don't have the proposal in front of them, a construction phase beginning in July of 2019. Mm -hmm. How flexible do you view that timeline and what areas could be accelerated if needed? Sure. Well, the, uh, the biggest issue is, is putting together the finan financing for the project, so making sure that you have all town approvals. So assuming that the town can approve the project in a linear fashion, um, you know, we can get this designed in about nine months, uh, and then it'll take about 15 months for construction, so a total of 24 months. So that's the minimum time frame. We're as flexible as you are. So if you can get the money together, we can get the plans together and, and get it built. Um, obviously, that's dependent on the land swap or the, the, the land deal, whether that can be done in that same time frame. Um, but we're, you know, we're ready to start. I, uh, we just felt that that was what was going to be necessary in order to get the financing in place. So, so all the financing is in place. That's great. The only uh, sp uh, item that needs to be uh, officially confirmed is the state legislature needs to approve a special act. Sure. Um, our state representative is working very diligently to uh, expedite that process, and yep. I think we're hope very hopeful that the town of South will own the land and fully control the land as early as the fall, maybe even late summer. Yeah. So I guess just under that on circumstance, excuse me, then you could, so if we say the clock starts, say September 1, as I said, we need about nine months for design. So then we could be under construction in July of 2018. Okay. So there's no limitations on your none firm's ability to start right away. Absolutely none. In fact, Alicia is very available. So she's completing the um, Randolph Community Center, uh, Intergenerational Community Center in September. Uh, and her other project is in Webster, um, so she's actually sort of right on the way out here. So, so we're, we're both very available. Okay. If you were sitting on this side of the table, mm -hmm. 
in interviewing uh, potential owners project managers, what important question would you say that we should be asking of those companies? I would say uh, th that's a very serious question, actually, because and we often interview architects, so it's 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 the same issue uh, with architectural teams. So it's do you have the personnel available at this time to do the job? Are you so? There's a lot of questions. Are you qualified to do the job? Have you demonstrated those qualifications? And, and excellence in the projects that you've managed? Um, how do you differentiate yourself from your competition? Um, and, and why are you the right firm? Not just, uh, it, frankly, the four firms that you've got probably are all qualified. So why are you the best firm for this assignment? I know what you're gonna follow up with, but <laughs> go ahead. You, you, you're welcome to answer it. <laughs> well, I, we have, uh, we have a combination of things that I think uh, make us the best. We actually don't often spend a lot of time with our competitors, so I can't necessarily say exactly what they do, I'll be honest. But as I said, we have in-house cost estimating, which I think is, is unique to our firm. And what that does is allows us to really manage cost. And cost is probably 40 to 50% of the issue during pre-construction, so in other words, What's really important about the pre-construction phase, the design phase, and especially the feasibility phase is to get the site right. I think you guys are well on your way to that. B, to get the schedule right. We've talked about how you do that. But C, to get the cost right, because you need to right-size the building with respect to matching up your program to the available funds. And we've done some you know, back-of-the-napkin calculations about the budget you have. I think it's good. I think it's, it's going to be a little tight as you progress farther and farther because costs are going up considerably, 4 and 5% a year. So, but I think that $22 million should be adequate to build the size of building you want. So we just have to continue to make sure that the costs are aligned to the budget and that the size of the building is, is aligned to the budget. Again, 35,000 square feet, I think that's a good size. It's the same size as what we built in Sharon. Um, so we've looked at that side by side. I think you're looking at five bays. Five bays, I think, is, is the right way to go. But we also don't want to shrink the size of the bays. We want nice wide bays. Why? Because long term, it's going to be more flexible and it's going to be safer for the personnel. So there's a lot of decisions that we're going to make along the way. So uh, it's a long-winded way of saying we, we know how to study the program, we have the experience with this building type, and we can, we can control the cost. Okay. So uh, obviously you've looked at some of the publicly available documentation Absolutely. for um, this. Specific to the schematic design documents, what do you view as the most challenging aspect of this particular project, and what do you view your role as making sure it does not become an obstacle in terms of the project timeline and cost? We can both, but I think uh, siting is the building. Siting, is some of it is, I know you want to be able to keep the golf course mm -hmm. operational. Um, how, how we do that without expending a ton of, we could certainly put a ton of money in the golf course, but we don't want to do that. We want to put the right amount of money in there and keep that operational. Of course, the school nearby safety will be more than our number one concern about that to make sure that is safe. Um, so, but the site will be, to, to get it just right, a lot of those had studies where the building was, you know, scooting, moving. I'm not sure where that wasn't totally clear where it, if it finally landed. I think that's part of the beginning process is to review some of that. But you've zoomed in on an area. I think site will be tricky to balance keeping the golf course going and the, and the safety of the school and not disrupting. Your other neighbors seem far enough away that those they shouldn't be an issue. Or dead. Just oh, <laughs> They're quiet. <laughs> circulation, into, you know, whenever you're yeah. building a, a new fire facility, the circulation of the trucks and making sure that that can be done A, quickly and B, safely is really paramount. So we have to just make sure we don't shortchange that interior circulation space, if you will, within the site to make sure that the fire trucks can maneuver uh, in a way that doesn't require backing in, in general. Um, we're, we try to avoid backing of fire trucks whenever possible. Unless the chief is driving, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so along those lines, do you have any concerns about the project cost design or other factors that you've seen thus far in your review that you feel we need to address sooner rather than later? No. Okay. No, as I said, I think the, the size of the building, you know, I don't mean to be flippant, but we, the size is a little on the large side. So we, we tried to benchmark you against other, other facilities of this uh, nature in, 
similar size community, so we try to relate the size of the building to the population. You're a little bit on the larger side, but I think that's A, because of the five bay configuration, and B, because of the public space that you're looking at. You know, 1,400 square feet is slightly larger for a fitness room than other facilities, but you know, maybe it should be 1,200, but we can look at that, you know, just to see if that's gonna be adequate. But that's the type of tweaking we're talking about. So I don't mean to say that we haven't looked at it. We have, and we've looked at it carefully. But I do think that in general, you've got it right-sized right now. Okay. So we've touched on this a little bit, but the site for the new public safety facility presents us a challenge. Um, the objective is to build a public safety building on land currently operated as a nine-hole golf course sure. with the construction of the golf course during and after construction. Uh, sorry, continuation, continuation of the golf sure. course. Do you have any experience with such an approach? If so, please tell us about it and give us any initial thoughts on how best you would sequence and achieve this dual objective. Uh, no, no direct experience with building on a golf course. Um, but certainly, you know, we've built multiple stations on, you know, uh, Alicia just built one where we had an existing water uh, municipal water tank, municipal yep. water facility that was operational the entire time. So, you know, we were looking at, uh, at Sharon. Uh, they have a, a DPW in the back of the site, which was, again, occupied 100% of the time. And of course, DPW needs especially good access during snowstorms, not, you know, not reduced access. So, you know, we're very used to building within constrained sites. New England doesn't have a lot of nice, you know, this isn't Kansas. You don't have a nice open field site that you can go build on that's flat. Um, so we're very used to building on sites that have constraints like you do. Um, as Alicia said, safety is paramount. Security is important, uh, even in a suburban community, making sure that there's good separation. Um, and then, and just how the golf course is gonna deal with, you know, a, a revised clubhouse situation. You, you still, even though it's small, you gotta have something there to serve the golfers, right? So. Uh, so the town of Southborough has worked with Context Architecture, formerly known as Donham and Sweeney, for feasibility and schematic design. The Attorney General's Office has recently advised the town administrator that once an OPM is officially under contract, our committee can make decisions related to retaining context, moving forward, or going back out to bid. If you were selected as OPM, how would you propose running the process in retaining or selecting an architectural firm? Well, my first question to you would be, were you comfortable and happy exactly. with Donovan Sweeney? If, if, you, if you're like, I'm not sure, then we should go out and interview and, and get other, there's dozens of qualified architects in the Commonwealth who can help you. We can call the best ones in to get, hope, get them into an interview, get them to respond to the RFP and get them in. And then after that, it's like, who do you think you can work with? Who do you think you have good chemistry? If you don't feel like you had good chem chemistry with Donna Sweeney before, if you didn't feel like they were listening to you or whatever your issue was, you don't have to invite them back. But if you thought it was great, then you don't have to. It's up to you. I, we would right. we would follow your lead on that. I don't know, I don't know how your relationship with them was before, but we've worked with them with great success. Okay. Can you just any specific projects you've worked with them on? Yeah, it's been a while. So Dunham and Sweeney. It was at that time Dunham and Sweeney. It was with Brett Dunham. I'm gonna have to think about it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> we can we can ten years ago, maybe twelve. Your name on all sorts. Of I stuff. know. I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> but yes. So uh, final question from me before I open up to the rest of my uh, committee members. Uh, what experience do you have integrating the various aspects of technology into public safety buildings? What approaches have you taken in other public safety projects to find appropriate resources to review this critical infrastructure? Yeah, it's, it is critical. There's the Salisbury Police Station. There was a lot of um, reconsidering during construction, which was expensive. And so I would want to make sure that we ask all the questions. I, I jumped on during construction. I wasn't working for at the time, but I think there was a new chief in town. I think he didn't quite get and understand what he was into, so that's why it led to uh, things being brought up during construction. Luckily, we were still able to bring it in, actually still under budget, but that's not the best time to make decisions. But there are a lot of uh, technological security you know, concerns, because there's three layers of circulation in a police station, and with the fire station, it would probably be at least four, uh, that you've got to keep separate. 
you got to keep the prisoners away from the firemen, away from the public, away from you know the all the um, police officers, and so that's a level of security. And then of course a Sally Port and Sal's has its very own security. And then if you have if this is going to be your emergency operations center, again more you got to have more redundancy and things like that. And if you're going to have how much of it are you going to record and on cameras and how many cameras do you need and those things all need to be considered and yeah. ask all the questions before we start building all right uh so i think uh with that being said i'm just going to go right down the table i'll start at my right and i'll just work my way down uh mr lyons any questions um, i was heavily involved in <coughs> excuse me building a police station mm -hmm. um, change orders inevitable um, we had one $24,000 change order, and it was an error by the site engineer on, you know, shooting the um, front driveway. Mm -hmm. And we had a utility company charge us $15,000 for a new utility pole, and then they cut it off at the same month. What would you do for the town to recover that cost? Well, to, to recover the cost? Well, to negotiate, I would say, because the prices, you know, when you do the the um, change order. Sure, They're all or higher, realized. yeah. So w w there's, a, there's a number of things that we do. Um, obviously the best thing is to mitigate change orders. So you mitigate change orders by extremely thorough drawing review. So we do in-house, very detailed drawing review. So just as an example, we're, we're sorry about the feedback, we're working on the Bourne Police Station right now. Um, and uh, even at schematic design, we have a team of three people, Alicia, myself, and the project manager, Joe Sullivan, all reviewing the plans, even at a schematic stage, just to make sure we have doors opening in the right direction, even though the architect has done what I think is a pretty good set of plans. Um, so, so that's number one. So very thorough. And that, that drawing review uh, goes right through the end of the construction documents when it goes out to bid. Um, number two, as Alicia says, we'll work closely with the both police and fire staff to make sure that they totally understand what they're getting so that they're, it's not just a set of plans that will literally do page turns uh, of, of every page on the plans and in the specs, so which is a boring but important process. So they understand exactly what they're getting. If they've got a tack board, board shown to the right of a, of a door and it should be to the left, we, we will get into that level of detail as project managers. Then thirdly, um, we will work closely. We work as a team with the contractor and the architect. We do not believe on in the you know the stick approach to project management. So we work together, and we resolve things as they go, so that they don't become claims that get that fester along. Um, we'll also recommend you have a contingency. You know, there's what's called a standard of care. Nobody wants to hear that, but but architects are allowed to make some mistakes. You don't have. There's literally thousands and thousands, probably over 10,000 little decisions that are embedded in a set of drawings, all the way to, you know, what, what the uh, uh, pull uh, width is, pull uh, uh, distance is on a door versus the push and so forth and so on. All those decisions, inevitably there's going to be some mistakes made. Now, should they be egregious mistakes? Of course not. Um, but we're, we're going to work with the architect and the contractor to try to mitigate the cost of those. And then, at worst, if you are paying a change order, that you pay a fair price for it. There's no reason you should be overpaying. You don't have much negotiating power, obviously. You don't have leverage over a contractor if you're adding something. But as an example, we're, we're doing a school in New Bedford. It's a $27 million school. We're under $50,000 in, in net change orders after 11 months of construction. We only have a month and a half to go. So it can be done in public construction with very minimal change orders. Thank you. Sure. And because of our in-house cost estimating, I've, many times a contractor is presented as saying, I go check with cost estimating and I come back and I go, this isn't lining up. Can you check right. your numbers and come back? And I can do that like in real time and get them to, you know, prove to me otherwise why I, I don't know, you know, explain to me why you think this is going to take you 30 hours. My department thinks it's going to take you 10 help me understand, stuff like that. So that's a resource I have available to help understand and make sure that you're, again, paying a fair price for the inevitable change orders. Thank you. Mr. Brittany? What's the uh, 
the largest obstacle or concern that you have with the project? Probably, uh, again, the new construction is reasonably straightforward, so it would be site issues. So making sure that the soils that are, are there are suitable. Looks like there's been some fill in, in that area. Um, I don't have a geotechnical report, but just you know, having looked at the, the landforms, um, looks like there's been some fill over time. Obviously, there's wetlands, bordering wetlands on, I believe, at least two sides. So working with the Conservation Commission to mitigate any issues there. Um, so it's all about the site and then, again, how we do internal circulation. There's going to be a lot of pavement. Um, so how are we going to deal with drainage from that pavement? Even though the building's not that large, it's likely to be a two-story building. Most public safety buildings are two stories because you don't want to go three. Um, so, you know, we're going to have a footprint of, say, 20,000, 25,000 square feet, um, which isn't that large. But then we're going to have another half an acre or more of, of paved surfaces in order to get that circulation space. So these days, of course, we can't have runoff beyond our own property. Um, so we're going to have to mitigate that on site and make sure that it gets to the wetlands in a clean fashion. Um, so that would be my biggest concern. It's not something that can't be designed for, but you don't want to spend a fortune. And we look at uh, sort of low impact drainage systems these days, which are things like um, rain gardens, things like, uh, you know, we don't just do dumping into, you know, into, a, uh, into the ground essentially in an untreated fashion, yeah, into a big tank. Um, because it's not good design. Anything further? No. Ms. Scott? So I've got a couple questions. Um, this kind of goes back to what Mr. Mark said a minute ago. Um, would you guys hesitate when you look, when you actually look at the plans, look at the details, to recommend changes that you think really would improve the project and hopefully save money. For example, um, the example you gave of reducing the exercise room from 1,400 to 1,200 square feet. Um, if you see other things like, I don't think you need a stoplight, um, I don't think you need a tower, um, whatever, and these are just things, um, would you hesitate to say, um, or just, or would you, is it, are you more prone just to kind of go along with what you have seen us do and say, well, why upset the apple cart? N no. Absolutely my not. my yeah. my opinion is included, so you, yeah. you <laughs> I I am I tend to be pretty um, I have my opinions. I'll share them with you. I'm not going to be a bully about it. I'll put on the tell you tell you what my concerns are. But it's up to you guys, or it's up to the building committee, or and the and the chiefs to decide ultimately what they want for their building. I'll say, well, this is my concern, and this is why, and they can go. I disagree with you. Okay. okay, but based on your prior experience, you you'd be able to say I you really need twelve hundred oh, square feet. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. At least you had. I'm not. I'm not. Twenty years as a registered shy. architect, um, <laughs> you know, with a large firm, so she's very good at the architectural aspects. And again, Tom Katsunas is uh, who lives nearby in uh, Marlboro. Um, is a, is an engineer. So we're gonna we're gonna be looking at all those things. And no, we're not at all shy about about pointing out issues where we think they come up. The other thing we'll do, by the way, now, and we haven't talked about this, is we'll go look at the best of the best amongst the stations. And the best of the best doesn't necessarily mean the most expensive, but we, we will go look at other public facilities, both police and fire, with you. Um, even if you've done it before, we're still going to want the chiefs uh, and drag them out to say, you know, does this make sense? This is the latest and greatest. This is what we did in, in Sharon. We're going to open in Sharon, in, in, as I said, in a month. What did we do, in your opinion, right and wrong here? Um, you know, we, we've done 80-foot bays, we've done 81-foot, we've done 84-foot bays in, in three different stations, each probably for the right reasons for that particular station. But we want to make sure that we don't build 84 feet when we can do it in 80, as an example. That four feet across five bays, you know, that's over 100 feet across. That's 500 square feet at $500 a square foot. You know, it adds up very quickly. So we're going to look at those so-called uh, competitive facilities or, or, you know, sister facilities around the Commonwealth <coughs> and see what the best solutions were that have been come, that have, those towns have come up with and see how that fits with Southboro's needs. Okay, so sort of related. Um, there's budget divided by 35,000 square feet is over 600 bucks a square foot for Correct. just building cost. Um, there are builders that live here, there are buildings, builders that live in Boston that scoff at building a building for 600 bucks a square foot. They build buildings to, to make money and try to save every penny they can. So if you were to try to explain to someone who knew nothing about the difference between municipal construction and non-municipal construction, 
what would you tell them as far as why it's always so much more on the municipal side and why you really can't do that much about it? Well, interestingly, I would first tell you that municipal construction is less expensive than institutional construction of a similar type done by colleges and universities, for example, around the Commonwealth. So in other words, the bidding system works very well. But putting that aside, because obviously it comes up often, you know, oh, I can build that for $250 a square foot. I can build it for 300. I just built an office building for 320 bucks a square foot. Why is a fire station that's half a garage going to cost 500 in so what I would do is I would certainly walk them through the process of what filed sub bids are all about because that's the world we live in, how that adds to um, the layering of costs. But I would also just show them what these other facilities based on actual bids have come in at. You know, we bid Middleborough Police within the last six months. We've got a project in New Bedford Police Fire. We have actual numbers on Sharon. We have actual numbers on Medfield. And just walk them through, because they're, these people do have a certain logic, right? And so help them understand how costs are progressing, why they're going up, how they're going up, and exactly what other cities and towns have spent on their municipal facilities. Um, that's the best way to educate, to say that you're not outlying. It's not the fact that we're designing some quote unquote Taj Mahal. It's the fact that that's what these buildings cost. The electrical systems alone in police stations cost $75 a square foot. All those technological doodads that, that uh, Alicia touched upon, which are really critical to safe and efficient operation of a f police facility today, are extremely expensive on a square foot basis, especially with smaller police stations like you have. So in other words, when you're doing a, you know, a police station for a 10,000 person municipality versus a 40,000, you need all the same stuff. Rick Salisbury, just the communication, the line item for the communication room, the dispatch room, and the tower, the two 911 stations and a backup 911 station, I want to say the line item and the budget for all that was $250,000 for the tower, for all the computers, for all that, for an 18,000 square foot building. That's a, a very lot. specific, expensive infrastructure needed, very specific to police station, for an area that has a dispatch. You are having it get an efficiency. You're getting one dis, a shared dispatch, but it's still it's an expensive dispatch that an office park is not going to have that. Right. Okay, um, two more um, <laughs> cost estimator. Yes. So it sounds like you think that your cost estimating process is unique to your firm, and that your competitors don't necessarily have that inside. They don't have it in house. That's right. Okay, so why not? I mean, why do you have it and and they don't? And I guess I'm looking. <laughs> confused about so this person's going to come in and is he going to look over the general contractor's shoulders while he's getting his bids I mean what's he going to do specifically yeah great question well it's mainly she Delwyn Williamson um, and and what she will do uh, and she heads up a group of six is during design she will develop very detailed cost estimates at each stage of design that will then be presented to you and Alicia and I and Del will come and present to you the cost estimate, so you know exactly what all the line items are and what they cost within the facility. With the architects, right? With the architects. So, so the way we do are it. Are you getting bids? I mean, how are you getting those numbers? So, um, I'll go back to. I'll, I'll answer that question, then go back to why we have a cost estimate department because that's a good question, um, and one that I don't think about enough. Um, we get numbers through a variety of ways. We, we estimate both for our own projects and for other architects' projects, so we're constantly getting bids back on multiple municipal facilities around the Commonwealth. So we know from a database of costs of actual bids through the filed sub-bid process and the general contractor process exactly what buildings cost, what people bid on them. We're talking to the suppliers that are out there. We're talking to the subcontractors, and we understand from them where they're bidding. Uh, we're looking at indices of cost, steel, rebar, other commodity product, products that go into a construction job. So we're constantly getting feedback about the market and using that feedback to, to really give us numbers as to where, we're, uh, where we think the market is going. Um, so the way, as Alicia started to allude to, the, the way we do that is we do two parallel estimates, an estimate by the owner's project manager <coughs> and an estimate by the architect. We then reconcile that estimate at the end of each 
phase, so schematic design, design development, and construction documents. This is well before bids are actually received. So there's two estimates prepared. They're reconciled. They're presented to you. You understand at a, at a, at a very detailed level what things cost and why they cost what they do, and then you go forward with the budget to the town <coughs> that's solid, that's based on fact, that's not based on guesses, um, and that then is oh, you can manage the project through that budget. So then back to your question, why do we do it in-house? We, we actually, in 1989, when I started the company, there was a, a, a thing called a recession that occurred about <laughs> a, a year later, and I came from, actually came from an estimating company, and people started to call me and say, well, I don't have any project management work, but I could use some estimating done. So another guy and I literally started doing estimating to, to keep the lights on. We've kept that through that entire, you know, uh, 20, uh, whatever, 27 year history of our company because we found that it's an extremely valuable service. Um, so we do it all the time. We have six people, as I said, who specialize in it. And we do it not only for our own projects, but for other architects and engineers. So we think it's a great match with the owner's project management services. When does the general contractor's bid come into play, though? You, you do your estimating first so that we know what to expect? Sure. So, so the way these projects work is that there are three milestones. There's schematic design, design development, also called DD, and CDs, or construction documents. That takes about the eight to nine months. Then you put it out to the market. So there's, there's two stages of bidding. Filed sub-bids, which is 13 or 14 filed sub-trades that actually submit their bids to the town ahead of the general contractor submitting its bid. Electrical, HVAC, plumbing. This is unique to Massachusetts. We're the only state in the country that has that system where you have these filed sub-bids. Um, then, two weeks later, the general contractor submits its bid that's based upon all of these filed sub-bids, which make up about 52% of the cost, plus the other 48% of the cost, which is site, drywall, and other aspects of the work. Then he puts those two numbers together and gives us and you a final number. In Massachusetts, low bid wins um, almost always. We pre-qualify both the filed sub-bidders and the general contractors to try to weed out any bottom feeders who may be going after the project. Um, so there'll be a pre-qualification process, but once that pool of contractors is established, that's who bids on the project. So that bid is received nine months from after we start. That's the only number that really matters. The estimates then go away, don't matter, they're history, but they hopefully, if they're done well, and we've done it well very successfully on multiple projects, they're very close to the actual general contractor's bid, so your budget is right. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Mary. How you doing? Um, I just have a quick question. Forgive me for being late. Um, I know that our timeline is definitely important, and you've probably are go already gone over this, but uh, the timeline that we have is to have shovels in the ground in the spring of 2018. Sure. Would you mind just going over that again? Sure. What we said is it takes about nine months for design, so if you have site control or know that you're going to have site control and then you have an architect on board, you need about nine months from that point until you go out to bid. So you're not going to have shovels in the ground until the summer, likely. To do it in the spring would be really rushing the process. But you need about nine months from, say, pick a start date. If you stay with context architecture, it's probably around August 1 that they actually get started. So then you need nine months from that point to have bids, <coughs> what we've just described. So four and five takes you to June of, of 2018 start. Okay. You open about 16 months later, so you open September 2019. Okay. Very good. That's all I have for questions. Thank you. <coughs> um, you see, cost is a big deal to us. How close are you guys, or have you been on pre bid numbers to actual contract numbers? And then also, what have the percent of change orders been to the contract number? Yeah. That you've seen on your job. Sure. It, we, we've been able to be very successful with our estimates. New construction is still very competitive, so we're still seeing favorable bids for new construction jobs. So I will tell you that you're in a good spot. So we just bid uh, a library in Stoughton. That came in at, uh, estimated at 10.6, came in at 10.7, but there were a couple of bidders who dropped out along the way. In Webster, uh, we came in over a million dollars under 
the estimates. Again, very competitive bid, so that's a Webster Library. New construction, under construction now. Uh, Randolph Community Center came in two or $300,000 under our estimate on 10.4, so just about right on the money. Um, we, we, we try to be just a hair over the actual uh, contractor's number because then, you know, everyone uh, feels good moving forward. Um, the uh, change orders for new construction should be a couple percentage points. Bellingham uh, Police Station, which we opened last year, uh, about 2% change orders overall. So, um, you know, and those were, many of those were site related, which gets back to the previous question about my biggest concerns. Um, so those are, those are doable numbers, 2% change orders and under is very doable. Okay. And to minimize site change orders, we'll encourage you to do borings now, as right. much site investigation now, so we learn as much as we can now what's in there. So right. to minimize surprises, I can't promise that there won't be surprise. I can't possibly tell you there might be, oh, I don't know, big rock pile right. there that you didn't know was there. Like we, the, at the Webster Library, we did borings around, but it turns out when they built that first library, they dumped all their stuff, which is under now the parking lot. So we found their construction debris, which was they dug up all these rocks and we found those. That's why, you know, we it's found a, a lot easier, of that stuff. easier to predict what goes on above right. the ground. Than it is below. below. Right. So. Well, and we're, we're getting tricky, too, with our site because we, we know what the building wants to do. We don't know what we want to do with the rest of the golf course. So we have a number now, currently, what our site should do for the building. We don't know how we're going to affect that moving forward in the future. Yeah, it looks like one to two holes may be impacted a little bit. Correct, by, correct. Yeah. So we, but how we wrap that up into this project, we're still yeah. struggling. The town is going to operate the golf course going forward. Is that the intention? After. Or, or through, a, correct. through a management company yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or at least only, only Correct. towards. Good. Yeah. Mr. Wood. Hi, thank you for coming. Sure. I just have a question on staffing consistencies. Yes. I, I see that Ms. Monks will be running the project and probably spending a lot of time with us. You said you have 14 clerks of the works on staff. That's correct. How much time will be dedicated to us by the clerk of the works? From the references I've checked, they're very, very important. But my question is, Will it be the same clerk of the works on the project throughout, or are we going to have 14 different yeah. ones splitting time, trying to communicate yeah. what's going on to each other, well, or just the we, one? We don't switch. We don't switch out the clerks. The clerk uh, that uh, Alicia's had on on Randolph has been with us for 14 months. I'm moving him on to his next job after construction is complete, after closeout is complete. You know, I've had a guy in Peabody, Rob St. Laurent, for three years. Um, we we don't switch out the the on-site reps. We don't do that at all. I don't believe in that. These guys, I mean, the only occasion where I would is if you asked me to, and that's happened once in the last five years because a guy was thought to be too, uh, too hard on the contractor, which was a mistake I made. I should not have, I should not have listened to the client in that, res that <laughs> front. Um, but sometimes you might see somebody, will have a guy come in, if the guy who's your full-time clerk has the right to go on vacation. Correct. We they might have a guy swing in. Will have a but most of the time, up. it'll be the Absolutely. same part of the works. Same person all the way through. Not yeah. like four different ones during nope. the week, just communicating, nope. sending right emails saying, oh, I found this problem. Follow one up of those on 14 that. guys, and he will be on the job the whole way through. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Rooney, thank you both for spending some of your Monday night with us. Um, Pleasure. I can tell you that when I reviewed your material, I was somewhat on the fence about bringing you in for an interview. And the reason for me being on the fence is, is somewhat um, unfortunate for you be because of your success and you're so busy. Uh, it seems like you have a lot of projects ongoing. Okay. And in the service industry, um, I think most of your clients, and I suspect we will as well, want to be considered your most important client. Do you go to a restaurant that's busy or do you go to a restaurant that's slow? That's right. So my question Which is this. Do you like yeah. <laughs> let, me, let, let me ask you this. How do you, how, how do you staff these uh, projects in such a way that the client is the most important client in your office? He can, he, I can tell you, he's giving, I'm wrapping up. Uh, Randolph, we were wrapping up in the fall. I'm, and so I have, basically, it gives me a, a project for th th three days a week. Right. So I... Wednesdays can be yours. You've got Alicia. <laughs> you've got Alicia right through. No, we, yeah. we um, So you, you know, I have. He paces it out, so I have enough time to be able to do, to spend at least a whole day with a client. 
if, if you need me. Here. This is, mm -hmm. I'm here. Yeah, it should be 50% assigned to this job. So, um, you know, we have things wrapping up. So I, I'm wrapping up uh, uh, a school in New Bedford that I alluded to that opens September 1, come hell or high water, um, <laughs> which I'm not sure which is coming. Um, we uh, are uh, opening up a middle school in Situate for $55 million, also September 1. So we have things that are, mm -hmm. that are wrapping up. And as, and as we said, Alicia has, um, has a job that's wrapping up you know, very soon. Um, I'm not totally facetious when I said, you, would you rather be at the busy restaurant or, mm -hmm. or the slow one on a Friday night? The, the reason that people in our business, uh, if they're slow or if they need work, um, it, it, it's not a good sign. We're, it's a busy market right now. We are busy. We've got a lot going on, but because we have a lot going on, we're extremely focused. You know, we we have a very long term. I have four years of backlog. We're sitting here tonight because this project slots very well into into our business model. Uh, we're, you know, we've got Tom that lives literally in the next town over. We're doing the Richer School in Marlboro right now, sixty million dollar project that Tom Katsunas is running. So, you know, we've got other projects in this area. We're working in Webster. Alicia lives in Waltham, so it's a nice, this is a nice short ride for us. She actually, we didn't mention it, but she actually went to school at St. Mark's. Right. So uh, we've got a good connection to this community. Let me ask you this, in your, in your materials, it indicates that you, uh, Mr. Marks, are going to be the project director. Correct. Mr. Gadzunas is going to be the senior project manager. Yeah. And Alicia is going to be project manager. What's the difference? Yeah. Why do you have three people? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question, and we didn't probably explain that. So Tom uh, really is just backing up me if something were to happen. Are we going to see was. Tom at all? Um, you will see okay. Tom with respect to specific engineering issues. As I said, he's okay. a PE. Um, he lives nearby. So especially with respect to those site issues, sure. yes, because yeah. I think that is critical. Alicia will be the main point of contact, uh, but I'm always there. We are not a big international mm -hmm. firm. You can always pick up the phone and call me. You know, I'm, I'm there as needed, um, but mostly it's yeah. going to be Alicia. When, when evaluating uh, jobs to put bids on, do you calculate or project out the number of overall number of hours that this Absolutely. project, and what did you come to this project in As terms said, of the number of hours? The project manager is about 50%. It'll be a little less during design, 30, 35% of her time during design, and 50% during Oh, sorry, bad, bad question. I'm talking quantitatively in terms of the number of hours to your firm that this project will involve. Oh, total number of hours. So, you know, if it's nine months of construction, we're talking, um, the estimating staff will spend about 60 hours per estimate, so that's about 180 hours. Um, Alicia will spend during design 30% of nine months, so that's three months times, sorry, I just don't think of it quite that way, three months times 160, so 500 hours, mm -hmm. plus or minus, plus, you know, some of Tom and my time, so they call that 600 hours all in. Um, and then during construction, we'll have a full-time on-site representative, uh, so that'll be, 15 months of full time, that's 3,000 hours. Um, and then Alicia will be between 33 and, thir and 50 percent. So call that average of 40 percent over 15 months is six months, again, times 188. So we're talking 1,100 hours there. Okay. But, but if I'm not counting hours, if you correct. need me to be here more. Yeah, I, I am just trying to figure it out. That's just, yeah, that's based on a 40 hour week. We're, we're being signed on to help you get your building done. And Look, whatever that takes, I'm here. One to question I wanted to ask you, Alicia, is your background seems to be in a registered architect, correct? I am. Why not, why wouldn't we be duplicating our efforts if we hired you because we still have to hire an architect? You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? In other words, are you going to? Uh, no, the law requires that that you hire an OPM I, for over at 1.5 million, and that OPM must be separate from the architect. I understand that, but why why is not your skill set duplicative of right. the future architect's skill set? Um, is it? I'm. It's not duplicative. I've ha I'm an extra set of eyes. I am. Mm -hmm. um, I. Worked with Shepley Bullfinch for 10 years. I worked as a registered architect for a total of over 20 years. I know what they're supposed to be doing. I did drawing sets for 20 years. I did, I, I well, not all 20, but I mean, I've done all the drafting. I was, I was actually doing construction administration for a chunk of that. 
I know what they're supposed to be doing. I'm the extra eyes to, ha to make sure that they're doing their job. And, and I'm just, I'm here to be the extra eyes, to be the extra help, to ask the questions, to guide the process, to get it through, to make sure you guys get your, the best value out of your, out of your building as you can. Good answer. One final question should be a quick one. How many other projects do you expect Alicia will be the project manager on while she, if, yeah, we, no, if, if she's our project well, manager? I said, that's a, I said she'd be about 50% of this job. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. So we are very quickly running out of time, but I didn't want to shortchange the chiefs or town administrator if there's any questions that you all had before we uh, move on to the next interview. And don't hold it against me. I went to St. Mark's, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, this, this will be our final question. You, you did not find my name in the blotter. I'll just tell you that. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, this question is for Alicia. Um, when I was looking at your proposal um, under your bio, it says you pr possess an in-depth knowledge about construct construction methodologies for public safety buildings. Could you explain that a little bit more in detail for us and how that would um, pertain to our building? Your building. So um, I was very involved in the Salisbury police all through construction because there was, the architect was struggling to do their job. So I had to help them quite a bit with their job. So I was, I got very much in the details of about how, how it all went together. And like I said, the chief was, I think, a newer chief, didn't quite get all the um, intricacies of all the security and the technology wanted in the building. It was my job to, to figure it out for him and to figure out what he needed and how to do it and you know, get it in there ahead of at the right time or ahead of the time in construction. Okay, so um, you didn't have any trainings or educations that you went to above and beyond no. anything normal that would pertain to, to police, fire facilities, public safety facility? Thank you. But you're welcome to call the chief. You know, uh, we'll get you his name. And, sure. Chief uh, Fowler. Yep, in, in Salisbury. In Salisbury and talk to him. But uh, but you know, while Alicia has done has done one, our firm has done like seven. So and we do bring that. And Tom and I have worked on other. So we're currently working on one in New Bedford, as uh, as we alluded to also. But part of my job for working for Richard is to review drawings, as he said. So I've probably since I started working for him, I review all the public safety buildings that come through the office for constructability and things like that. So while I've, I have worked on only a couple, I've reviewed the drawings for many and the, all the different building types. And so I've gone through them all and I can see them all and I have visited a bunch of them that have, that have been at various stages of construction and, and been for Salisbury, went on all the site visits to see all those buildings they went to see. So I have, I've seen quite a bit of uh, of the, of the process at various stages. Great. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thanks. We do appreciate you both, not only your effort in the submission, but spending the time answering from our uh, panel up here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming in. Just while we're transitioning, and just in fairness to everyone, um, if we can go one question at a, per person, and then I'll take another cycle through um, on the next next round. Mr. Rooney, you're going to be up first. <laughs> well, you got about 15, 20 minutes. Who's the next? Uh, Lamero Pagano. Mike Pagano. Mike, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Go down the line. Yeah. Jason Mellon. Nice to meet you. Yes. Mike Pagano. 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 Mike
So thank you all for uh, coming and joining us tonight. Just a, uh, a brief overview of how the process is going to work. It's going to be about approximately 45 minutes. Um, the first five minutes will give you an opportunity to just give any introductions to yourself, your firm, or anything else you believe are pertinent for our consideration in the process. The next roughly 15 minutes will be some questions that um, I will be asking as chair of the committee um, that are being asked of all the firms appearing before us tonight. And then the remainder of time will be um, pretty much rapid fire. We'll go down the line. Um, questions based on anything in your proposal, um, anything that they heard in the first couple of questions, or anything else of interest to us um, to make sure we're making the right decision for the town of Southboro. Um, any questions on the process? Nope. All right, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to come forward. Uh, uh, this is uh, a project that is very much in our wheelhouse in terms of its size and scope. Uh, it's also obviously a very important project for the town uh, and one that we feel we could uh, help you with and uh, see through to a successful conclusion. I'm Mike Pagano, I'm president of L LPA. Uh, I'm uh, assigned as the project director. Uh, in that capacity, uh, my primary responsibility will be to see that the team gets all of the resources it needs, and, and that would be primarily Mary, who's proposed as the project ma uh, manager, um, all the resources that are necessary throughout the process uh, for, for toward a successful conclusion. Um, Rob, you want to introduce yourself? And Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm uh, Rob Parra, Jr. Uh, I'm a principal with Lamar Pagano Architects, um, probably over about 30 years experience there, um, minus six years sabbatical that I took over in Europe working for a construction manager and architectural firm. Um, I'm listed as the project coordinator. Um, I've worked with Mary, who's going to be the project, uh, the project manager on the project, and we've worked for a number of years. She'll be mainly the main lead in it. but. I'll uh, be working to monitor the work of all of the consultants on the project, and um, I was the project manager for the Holden Public Safety Building a number of years back, so I draw a good deal of experience from that. As well as a unique project, different from Southboro, there are a lot of similarities, so, uh, you know, I'll be working to uh, just have a very clear review of addressing all the issues and the opportunities that you have. Hi, I'm Mary Bolso, your project manager. I realize this is a huge project for you, huge undertaking, and um, you have spent a lot of time on this for a lot of dedication. I'm prepared to step in and lead you further down the path. Um, I am familiar with Southboro. I've been working with Ryan Donovan at the library, helping him behind the scenes fill out some grant applications for the next um, Mass Historic Grant Round. Um, I understand the project, I've been researching it, I know the intricacies and how the collaboration is gonna be so important. There's so many groups that really have a vested interest in this between the golf course and the school and neighbors. And I think you've come a long way and done quite well so far. I know one of your concerns also was to have somebody with construction experience on your team. And a lot of you bring a lot of experience to it, but really as the OPM, we can help you with that. We can make sure that everybody understands their roles and responsibilities and, and further work on the to-do lists and the tasks like we put one in our proposal that we use regularly to identify roles and reduce duplication of roles and keep communication open. Um, <laughs> we decided that uh, I will moderate the questions unless you have a question specifically for one of us and just go right ahead and ask that question directly. Um, so we'd be happy to take your questions. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so first, uh, in your proposal, you submitted an estimated timeline. Uh, how flexible do you view that timeline? In what areas can be accelerated if needed? And likewise, what items may you see pushing us back or be as aggressive in your outline? I'll start, and Mary will, I think, pick up from, from uh, the beginning. 
Um, our schedule is in response to what we understand your expectations to be. The only area within the uh, schedule that uh, you have to date is the uh, amount of time that's shown dedicated to the contract, uh, contract document production phase. Everything else looked very doable. Uh, it's, a, it's a reasonable schedule. I think um, one of the first tasks would, I think would be to look at that time frame for preparation of those documents. But Mary, you want to yep. elaborate on that? So the obvious wild card is whether or not you retain contacts as your architect. If you decide, if the committee decides to go back out to bid for any reason, that will add length to your schedule. It's not a huge detriment to the schedule, um, so you need to make sure that you, it's the decision that you want. If, if you want a different architect, that's fine. We'll modify the schedule, we'll work with you. Um, and then the other thing is bringing in the school and the other entities early and anything that they need should be worked into the design also. So that could add a little time to the design. Not that you're gonna pay for it, but if there's some considerations for a traffic flow and, um, for the school, those things need to be worked in early and a lot of them aren't in there right now. So shifting gears a little bit, if you were sitting on this side of the table in interviewing potential owners, project managers, what is the most important question you would ask of those companies? Uh, uh, I would, I would look, I would look, you guys can help with this too, but I think what I would look for is strength in um, experience with a wide range of uh, specialties. Uh, it's important that the owner project manager uh, has the skill, the experience to, to uh, evaluate the process from start to finish. There are those who, who tend to be uh, um, more experienced, let's say, in the construction phase, others who have greater experience maybe in pre-design phase, um, and some who have a good balanced set of skills that they can offer. And I think that's important to look for, for help uh, across the board. Um, clearly, I mean, I could, I could list all of the, uh, uh, the skills that you would look to the owner project manager to bring to the project, but, but uh, I think it would be balance I would look at, and, and good experience in all, all primary areas. I can't believe you didn't say. Sorry? So you have four very skilled firms that you're interviewing. We are the only one that is both architecture and project management. Part of that skill set is having that second set of eyes to do a peer review, to realize some faults that may occur early on, to be able to do a comprehensive code review um, and a comprehensive peer review, understand, you know, Rob's strengths with the site and civil. All those strengths come together in our office because we have these extra in-house skill sets. Mm -hmm. yep, I think that covers it well. We all, it's a very broad-based firm that we have. Our clients have been around the same clients year after year after year, and I think that's, if you're looking for a firm that's dedicated to, it's, it's an important project for you. Our firm is very dedicated. You're interviewing four very good firms, and it's, you know, we're all gonna put in, we're gonna put in 110%. Great. So based on your review of the publicly available schematic design documents, what do you view as the most challenging aspect of the project, and what do you view your role is as making sure it does not become an obstacle in terms of project timeline and or cost? Um, again, I'll, I'll start. Um, the, um, the one area that we would immediately turn our attention to if selected, it would be the uh, the quality of the, the cost estimate versus the uh, uh, the scope of work that's anticipated, because the owner project manager was not involved uh, from the very beginning, there's always concern. Now that you've been to the to the town, appropriation has been made. You've represented to the community that you're going to build something that's going to cost this amount of money. So um, it's important that that happens that you get the building that that you need and and the uh, budget is not exceeded. We would immediately turn our attention to evaluating the uh, the accuracy of the estimate and the uh, uh, the, the, the features of the building having having uh, 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 properly addressing the program, which appears to be a, a good design. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's an issue. Do you want to? Um, yeah, I, I agree. Rob should. <laughs> yeah, no. A few the items is yes. You do have a set of preliminary design documents that were done, and we reviewed those with a with an estimate, and yeah, I noticed that you do have a few um, people that have added to the site, have a couple of suggestions for that. 
you know, it appears very well that you've, the, the fire chief has done a good doc, a good PowerPoint that shows comparison of buildings, what you have, what he needs, has done the police chief. I don't know the building the police chief used, but I know the one that the fire chief used. And, you know, and some of those is a collaboration with the architect to find out what, what he's put on the paper that reflects what your needs are. Um, you know, and how that's best suited to, to bring it further into the development, because what you're looking for is a program that meets your needs. You know, as a firm that really is drilled down into finding out what you need for police and fire state, a public safety building, and how it's gonna, how you're gonna turn that design to something that's best suited for what you need. And that translates into in some of the big wild cards are always when you're talking about the schedule. The schedule will follow its course, and we'll, we'll keep a good track on that. But it's budget. You wanna spend the money to do the program that you wanna do. You wanna look at things to save money where you can save money, but you do wanna get a, you know, you wanna get a long-term building out of this. And like Holden, there were plenty of opportunities that we saw with site and other things to be able to get more than what they needed and save quite a bit of money on that. Great. Could I add one other comment oh. I meant to make earlier? Um, we, we would also want to know more about the, uh, the impact of the building on the golf course. I mean, I, I know everyone, I'm sure everyone in town doesn't play golf, but uh, we, well, the information we have about the uh, uh, the impact of the golf of the uh, building on the, at its site development on the golf course is not complete. Um, we would we would assume that that's been given close attention. You had a very good golf course architect in uh, Brian Silva. We've worked with him before, um, so we were assuming that that was given uh, consideration and that you're satisfied that you've cited the building in a way that minimizes the the implication on on that uh, asset. Uh, so anyway, that would be, I would add that to the list of uh, uh, features of the project that we would look to. I mean, my, my answer, having been involved in the process, pretty much, at least through the entire schematic design process, would be that's something that has to continue to be studied. But our, the directive that's been given to this committee is to minimize the impact on the golf course while building <coughs> everything we promised to the town's yes. voters in terms of the func uh, having a functioning police and fire station um, together in trying to mesh those needs as best as possible. So that will be something that will probably be a continued conversation for the next two to three years is my guess. Mm -hmm. So um, along those lines, uh, do you have any concerns about the project cost, design, or other factors that you've seen thus far in our review that you feel we may need to, that may need to be addressed sooner rather than later? Do you want to start the detail on that? Maybe Rob would help. We went through it pretty extensively. I'm not <clears throat> overly concerned. I guess we'd want to sit down with the team and the architect and make sure that all the program meets the needs as far as shared space, security, the technology. Today's public safety buildings um, require extensive amounts of technology and security uh, for the communication and the officers themselves. What do you think? Well, I think the, the schematic design you have appears to cover, you know, when looking at it programmatically. Um, I have, you know, as Michael said on the other questions, we really want to sit down with everybody on the team and reassess where everybody is in each particular site, what the police fire department want, what the public entities are. And th then we can really comment on whether they're meeting the needs. There's nothing that stands out at me. Um, it, it seems like it works. The budget seems to work. They, you know, the budget that was presented, you know, has a traffic signal, has a site cost that went up from your earlier design quite a bit to now. So there's a lot of that's, that seems to be reflected in what the ARCID has done. And obviously we will have an estimator that we work with for a number of years that will get involved at a later point in time and we'll drill down on the estimate. Great. Um, so along those lines, the site for the new facility presents us with a challenge. Uh, the objective is to build a public safety facility on land currently being operated as a nine-hole golf course with the continuation of the golf course during and after construction. Do you have any experience with such an approach? If so, tell us about it and also give us your initial thought on how best to sequence our project and achieve this dual objective. Haven. I'll, I'll start that. The, the Haven, uh, I'll, maybe I will get to that one. I, what I was thinking, what came to mind immediately is that uh, LPA has uh, extensive experience with occupied buildings and sites. 
um, th throughout, uh, particularly in the last 20 years, uh, with, with um, uh, a, a wide range of building types. The, um, it, it's, it's an important question, and you, you're only going to be able to uh, satisfy yourself that you have a good solution until you study the impact of the project on the golf course, on the, on the street traffic, um, there's a school nearby, although I think it's sufficiently removed that uh, barriers can be uh, put in place that will keep the site safe. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's important to give careful consideration to that question. We, we don't really know enough about the project to give you a solution, but we certainly recognize the, the importance. Um, we've, we've had uh, projects that had to be very carefully coordinated constructions sequencing established before it went out to bid. Um, cases where, it, it, I can think of a school, for example, uh, with uh, 300,000 square feet total renovation of a building, 2,000 students fully occupied while uh, about $60 million was being spent. So it was a massive amount of, amount of work. So we have a lot of experience with planning projects from that, from that perspective. I guess, um the other opportunity, it's in the winter, but the golf course does have a small shutdown December 15th to March 15th. Um, so any work that could be done at that point would be helpful to the golf course. I realize that you don't own it, you're leasing it, you rent it out or however the community works it. And the idea is to minimize disruption. Obviously there will be some disruption. Um, just by the, you've got septic systems under holes, you're putting new buildings in but we will work to do whatever we can to mitigate that. Yeah. And obviously the phasing as you picked up is very important because you want to get the phasing directly in the contract documents. Um, you want the doc documents to be very clear and concise. When the contractor hit the road, he's building a building and he's, you know, that's the most efficient and quickest way for him to do it and that's the best way to, it's gonna say, get the best cost for you and just work that phasing into all the documents and obviously you have the, the, the school next to you which has a, you know, there's, there's one scheme here that shows the connection of the road and other things that I feel that I've heard are necessary, you know, if you bus and other, tra other access to and from that building. So the town of Southboro's worked with Context, Architect Context Architecture, which is formerly known as Donovan Sweeney, for both the feasibility and schematic design phases. The Attorney, General has recently, Attorney General's office has recently advised the town administrator that once an OPM is officially under contract, our committee can make decisions related to retaining context, moving forward, or going back out to bid. If you were selected as owner's project manager, how would you propose running the process for either retaining context or selecting an architectural firm? Well, um I think, as I mentioned, the uh, evaluation of the, of the documents to date, cost estimate, I think speaking with the architect and the like, talking with all of you, um, getting a better understanding of the program and the quality of the design as, as the building's program should be supported by the design uh, in detail, we would, we would want to go through that. I, from, from what we understand, uh, you, you've been happy with the architect and you, there's an interest from some in town to, to uh, continue with that architect. Um, but I do think, I think the right thing to do would be to evaluate their work to this, this point and then we would advise you at, at that stage. You want to, you know, I know you know yeah. the firm well. This well, <coughs> I guess my concern would be what has changed now their contacts? Is it still the same team? Were you happy with that team? Are you going to retain that team? You know, when companies are bought out or changed, staff falls off. Just to clarify, our understanding is there's simply a, a brand and name change. That's all it is, the, okay. The, the parties that we've worked with so are that still there, and the main contact is the owner. So, Jeff, the still, so that would be part of my approach is to sit with the committee, what were your pluses and minuses, what, and um, if you're happy, we can go forward the, with them, and if there were some concerns, you can work that into the contract. There are, there are obvious advantages to staying with the same architect. I, I don't, uh, I can tell you what they are if you want to, want to know the detail. Um, but I think, I think uh, due diligence would, re would require that you do an evaluation of the work, you report to the committee, and the committee make an informed decision. Hopefully all, all uh, indicators will point to uh, maintaining the relationship you have. That's what we would like to see. 
but if we see yellow flags or whatever, we would, we would bring them up and you'll make a decision. Okay. Fin and my final question is, uh, you touched on it very briefly, but um, what experience do you have integrating various aspects of technology into public safety buildings? What approaches have you taken in other public safety projects to find appropriate resources to review and make sure that this critical infrastructure meets the needs of both departments? I'm going to have Rob address that question uh, in um, uh, Holden, uh, the emergency services building. There was a, there was a team assembled uh, to uh, address that work, and Rob, Rob was a project manager for that work and is in a better position to discuss the details. Yeah, I, th I think you're all very aw well aware that there's more technology in a police station um, between the security systems. Uh, the camera systems, the cells, and all of that stuff. Um, you know, my experience recently has been the Holden Public Safety Building, that we work very closely with the architect that knows all of those systems, we work very closely with the town and the city. It, you know, the, the towns and the cities that we work with to find out was which systems they're looking for in a building, you know, and, you know, and how those are coordinated in with the documents that you can you get what you want, and you're able to bill it, bid it very, very concisely and clearly. Um, because the coordination of many of these systems and how they integrate and come together uh, can have a, a, enormous cost impacts on the project. So yes, there were a number of projects that I've worked on in the past. Uh, most of my public safety buildings have been a little older. Um, you know, I did do a, a building in um, Saxon, Germany, but I think none of that talk, no, technology would uh, translate here. So, Imperial I'd just, system. yeah, I'd just like to <laughs> add on to that. One of the reasons I went and took the training down at the, in Dallas for the chief of police um, was to learn about all the new changes. There's a lot that's changed just recently. Even if you've done a building in the past couple of years, now a lot of the departments require Faraday rooms. If you pick up somebody, you want to get their cell phone in that room right away before they can clear it. Um, the evidence storage, the amount of time you have to keep evidence has increased along with the ways that you save it. A lot of police stations have to have walk-in coolers now to save blood, wet, wet items. Um, the, I noticed the drawings had some hoods for um, investigation. So you've got a lot of those things in your documents, but things have really changed a lot in the past couple of years um, with, with the outside technology. And now it's important for the inside officers to have an equal playing field with this technology. Great. Thank you. With that, I'll uh, turn to Mr. Rooney. Thank you again for coming in. Um, the amount of due diligence you've done in terms of researching the project and, and expressing an interest, I believe, Mary, you were actually at our meeting the other night taking notes. I commend you that, uh, sir, for your team approach there. Um, and you also acknowledge that you know about the other four or the other three uh, companies that we're going to be interviewing, and they're all very good companies. Uh, reality is you're in competition with them. So my question to you is, what sets you apart from those others such that we should yeah. choose you uh, rather than them? Um, I'm, I welcome the question. Thank you. And you are right. You are, you're kind of, uh, I don't know if you're dining from a, f uh, a five-star menu per se, but they are all worthy candidates. I think what separates LPA, however, is the fact that uh, our firm has uh, not only uh, broad and, and extensive experience with owner project management, but also architecture. And the benefit of um, having architects, particularly early on in the process and throughout the process, is that the vast majority of problems that come with uh, public work, especially during construction, have to do with deficient documents. And that's an area that we excel. Uh, we've designed many, many buildings over the course of our 45 years. Um, the, um, that, that experience will, will bear fruit with uh, minimal change orders and construction delays, certainly at, at the uh, tail end of it, but, but also uh, early on. If there are issues with this building uh, in the terms of its design, if there are any problems that we see developing, we'll be able to pick them up uh, almost instantly. And uh, we'll get the architect involved. We'll talk about what we found. Uh, we can, we can, we understand the difference between being the architect and being the OPM. I want to emphasize mm -hmm. that. Uh, but we would, we would get together with the architect and the team, and we would, we would have conversations to uh, address any, any problem that, that might, that might serve us. Um, 
I, you know, we are we're basically local architects. I live in Shrewsbury. Rob lives in Westboro. Mary lives a half hour away from every project we've ever done. It's a joke. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's a project that uh, is perfect f from the perspective of size, complexity, and the like. It's also central Massachusetts. We, we, like, we like that. Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a project we could do very, very well. I don't believe that, is, is, that there really is anyone who could uh, match our uh, credentials for this work. Thank you. And I would just add, we also work very, very collaboratively um, with all parties. Um, we work with a number of architects over the years in a number of different methodologies and with towns. So we look to take the team and get the best from what every member of the team has. And we know how to bring that out with us. As I said, to give one, everybody gives 110%, you get a great project. And that's what we're striving for. Thank you. Mr. Wood. Hi. So I see you did the New Haven Country Club. How extensive was the renovation for that? And what was the most difficult challenge you had in trying to keep it a running golf course during renovations? Well, the, um, the ha the, I was uh, principal for that, for that project, uh, in part because I'm a golfer and I, I love golf courses. And <laughs> I mean, and I, and I am in a position where I can reserve certain work for myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, um, the first thing we did with the Haven was to, um, do you know the uh, ownership situation at the, at the Haven? There was a new owner who took over as a single owner now. It was membership, owned the, owned the golf course, owned the golf club for years. There is a single person now who owns, who owns that uh, property. And he, um, he described his vision for, for, the, uh, uh, for, the, for the golf course, for the building, for the supporting grounds, et cetera and then gave us his budget, and we knew immediately that there was an issue. I said, this is just, you cannot achieve everything you're looking for for the budget that, that uh, you've established. So rather than begin immediately with uh, his highest priority, which was uh, the, uh, uh, the site work around the building and the arrival uh, sequence for guests and, and uh, members, uh, he agreed to do a, uh, uh, a, a comprehensive capital plan for the property and he released us to do evaluations of all of the building systems, the core, the shell, mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, uh, all of the support features, including the pool and the, and the, and the uh, pool house building, uh, parking, circulation, et cetera. And after doing that, uh, going through that exercise, he realized that he had to order his priorities. He couldn't possibly do everything that he wanted to do. I think that was the greatest service that we, we provided on that project, and he undertook uh, the um, uh, initial work of uh, parking, circulation, grounds, a new entrance, um, replacement canopy. Uh, he spent money to uh, lower the grade so from the street you can actually see the entrance. Uh, and it uh, makes it a far more welcoming and uh, efficient um, a site circulation system as well. Um, it, was a, it was a real fun project for us and we're looking forward to the next phase. But I think he has to wait a while before he can do much more. Can I ask a follow-up to it? Did any of the holes need to be changed no. or moved or anything no. like that? No, there was work on the golf course. He had a golf course architect that was not under uh, our control or management at all. Uh, he worked with them separately. I can't remember his name, but he was, he's, he was well known uh, for this kind of work for renovation of the building. Uh, the only thing we had to do that would have any impact on the golf course was we had proposed moving the men's grill to a better location to, to see shots coming into the 18th green, you know, and uh, right now they had absolutely no connection whatsoever, and it was a lost opportunity, but otherwise it was done independently of LPA. And I'm not going to ask you to guys to add anything because I no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Moorhead. So I understand <clears throat> at Holden you had some issues with the fill or whatever, the, the site that was there. It was, they dumped stuff there for years. Um, you were very creative with how you wrote into the spec of, you know, past so amount, so much amount of dollars, they can only charge X amount for tons removed or something. What is a similar issue that you've seen on jobs um, above or below grade that you've seen ahead of time that ended up saving the client gobs of money, right? Um, anything similar, right? That, and do I have that right? Or do you want to even, do you, do you want to give some commentary on what you did there? And, well, and then answer the question, I guess? Sure. Of course, Holden Public Safety Building was a unique site. It was what 
uh, most towns used to use as a common dump. Um, where they used the DPW used it just to fill, just, just throw, uh, Route 122 is just keep, keep filling and filling and filling. Uh, there's even rooms of a school bus that was buried under there somewhere, which we never did find. Um, I'm sure it's still there. Uh, but it was a clear assessment of what your needs are in the particular site. Um, you know, get the geotechnical engineer involved in the first and figure out where the building was going to be level located, what we needed to do for structural fill for the building, different approaches and how to do it. So it's really the knowledge of, you know, of how sites are and what the best way to accomplish um, getting your building built. I mean, for another, the school that um, I'm the project architect on right now was Nelson Place School, had 60, 80,000 yards of material that had to be hauled off the site at an enormous cost, and about 20,000 was ledge. So there we also worked with the city to find a place for it, which was the Greenwood Street landfill, and work with early site packages to be able to get that stuff taken off the site as a separate package early so they can control the site cost and know what it was going to be. It was going to bid on a unit price basis, um, lump sum basis. Is, you know, it varied as the best way to handle it. Um, so that's, and withholding a lot of the stuff, a lot of the savings we had was site savings, in other words, which you don't particularly have, but within a butter, if there's any way that you could use, you know, eliminate retaining walls, you know, we ended up using a lot of the fill on it for the abutter, so he could, you know, we didn't need to build a very ex expensive wall. And I think there's, you know, up with a 200,000 savings that we ended up seeing at the end of that project based on some of these things. And the, the trade-off there was only eight parking spaces from 40-something. It was, was an excess amount of parking, but those last eight parking spaces, because of the size of the retaining wall, I think the retaining wall was closer to $250,000. Rob caught that and the uh, architect redesigned. But under the whole heading of cost control, unit prices, would, we would look to the architect to uh, use unit prices, add or, add or deduct alternates, wherever the case may be, uh, so that as you approach the project, you, because it's, you know, you, uh, you want to do everything you possibly can to keep the project on budget and not exceed that budget. And the, some of the measures that are available to you would be add alternates so that you could perhaps add some features that you would love to have, but you're not quite sure that the budget is going to control it. You can defer the decision until you receive the bids. Use of unit prices will minimize concerns with change orders and the like. If you, if you identify, in the case of site work, well, we think, you know, we've got, we found some bad soils over there. It could be a lot. You can't, no one has x-ray vision. So you, you would use a, a technique like a unit price so that when the contractor, if he did encounter more or less, you could, you could add the appropriate additional cost or take the appropriate uh, credit. And just jump on for Holden again. We have a lot of things we wanted the contractor in this case was a design bid build job to just have his building to build and move on with it. But there was, you have a septic system sitting in the middle of where your building is that needs to be relocated. So that may be something that you could consider alternatives to get that moved first. Um, with Holden, they had a tower that needed, you know, the radio tower that needed to be relocated. We ended up having the down DPW build it them, build a foundation themselves and somebody came in, set up the tower which is pretty, un it sounds very sophisticated, it's pretty low key. They just put wheels on it and they drive it up from where it's fabricated and one day the thing is up. So taking the building down in advance and moving the building down. So a lot of strategies that we used on that particular job based on how the town operated with the DPW, what the fire department, the police department could do. You know, so those were other strategies we'd look to do also here. Mr. Barry. Um, so I guess my question would be geared towards um, staffing and just um, how, um, which one of you will we, will we be dealing with mainly, or do we, um, uh, and how much time you, you would um, be devoting of, of your workload you to, you want, to this project? Take that, Mary? So I would be the main person. I would be here as much as needed. I think we put in 16 to 24 hours. Obviously, there'll be peaks and, and valleys in that, and then there will be a full-time clerk on site during construction also. Okay. Are you going to be working on any pro uh, excuse me any other projects uh, at the same time? Is Actually, it's um, a excellent opportunity. I'm just finishing Boylston. Uh, it's it's closing out. We've probably got one more contractor, one more the uh, contractor meeting is done, one more owner meeting hopefully, and that's it. Um, I am on Lester, but there's a full time person out there also, um, and Lancaster is about 50 percent done, and that's that's only a three million dollar job. It's not a full time project. Okay. 
So in the future, do you think you would still, um, we would we'd have primary access to you? I yeah, I would be the primary. I, um, I've been described as a hunter-gatherer. I, I eat what I kill. So <laughs> I don't bid every job that comes down the pike. I wait till an opportunity. I weigh out what work I have, and I go for the That's ones that drive me. Would, LPA would never submit a proposal for work that we could not give the attention that it deserves and, and warrants. I can assure you that every resource at, at our disposal will be given to this project that's, that's necessary. At the same time, um, you're, you're lucky that Mary is available for this project. Uh, her experience and knowledge is so broad, diverse, that she's, gonna, she's not going to need as much attention as other PMs might. Um, we, but whatever, whatever is necessary, the, the project will, will have. I can assure you of that. And it does come forward at a very good time for us. Boylston is closing down. Let's say Le uh, Lester now has gone into construction. Um, the um, Menden is done, right, Mary? Yeah, that's done. Um, so it, it, is a, it has come forward at a really good time for us. Thank you. Ms. Cook. What do, you mean, <clears throat> what do you mean by what you just said at PM needing more attention? Well, Mary, Mary is a very experienced and, and uh, um, educated owner project manager. Um, she'll, from working together, I know that Mary will, will come to us whenever she needs assistance with the work, uh, whether it's, she'll know immediately if it's, a, if it's something for Rob uh, to uh, assist with or if it's something for me to assist with. Um, but she has, she, she has all the ability necessary to manage this, manage this project on her, on her own. Um, with that said, uh, Rob and I are, will, are available. We know there'll be times when um, our particular expertise will be valuable to the work and, and she'll, it'll be available to her. Okay, so we're supposed to only ask one question, but that wasn't my question, so here's I'm the real question. And this was a compound question. Oh, um, what kind of bidding environment do you think we're going into, assuming we start, try to start constructing late spring, early summer next year, number one. And number two, do you feel like your role is to be a independent evaluator of the schematic design with an eye toward trying to um, make a change that would be something that, change is something that you don't think we should do, we, 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 something we, we don't need, based on seeing other buildings. Do you think that's your role to, to challenge that? Well, I don't know. Um, I, th I do think it's our role to challenge anything in the design or the, or the cost estimate that we think is, a, is an issue. Um, if we don't know, it, had we been involved from the very beginning and been monitoring the programming, we could tell you this building perfectly supports the program that you have. We just, we don't know at this point. It wouldn't be responsible for us to make that judgment for obvious reasons. Uh, so we do think it is our responsibility uh, if we do see anything with the design, programming, or, or cost estimating, it, it doesn't mesh. As far as your question about the, uh, uh, the climate, construction climate, um, the, the climate is improving for, for contractors. There's, there's more work around now than two years ago. Um, I think that the schedule to have this out to bid next spring, uh, if, if, if that's in, in fact what you intend to do, which we would expect with construction, the DD and CD work that's ahead. Uh, the predictions, I think, are running around 5% for uh, uh, inflation, yeah, inflation. Per, per, per year at the moment. It's very, very difficult to say. That's why I, I would advocate for ad alternates and the like, some protections from cost overruns, uh, so things that may be unforeseen at this time. What do you see um, as the largest concern or obstacle with the project? Um, I, well, I think the, I guess the largest concern would be the, uh, for me, is the, uh, uh, is the golf course. I mean, I, to see, to see that that's, that is in fact, um, been properly addressed and fully addressed. We've only seen <coughs> snippets of sketches and the like that appear to be um, thought has been given and that you have a project that will not so greatly impact the golf course that it'll ruin an important asset for, for, the, for the town. Um, 
I mean, at this time, the, uh, the design looks solid, the, the estimate looks solid. Um, you've, you've got a good architect on board. We're pretty confident that you're on solid footing, but uh, we, would, we would look forward to that first task of evaluating uh, those, those features in greater detail. Mary, you want to? Um, I can, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. It's not just the golf course. It's the public safety, making sure you get a building that's going to last 40 to 50 years. It's, you know, the biggest project you've done. You want it to be done right. Um, and part of that as OPM is making sure we get the right contractor, too, not just the right architect, making sure that we pre-qualify contractors and subcontractors and not being afraid to disqualify if needed, which we have done. Yeah, no, uh, I don't. I actually don't see any great concerns. I see a process uh, that we can help you very greatly with. I see that you when it came out with an RFQ that was very, very detailed, outlined exactly what you were looking for. Um, I, I think we, in our proposal, I think we addressed all those issues. So I think it's really a matter of just following through, setting the sequence to follow through, setting the timing, um, getting a good permitting matrix. Again, I don't have the opportunity to see any of the programming documents. Um, but, you know, get a good permitting matrix that you could put together and saying all of the hurdles you have to go through with the times involved with them and just get the process in motion and working with, you know, you got a, a good architect, get, as Mary said, uh, make sure you pre-qualify whomever's going to be bidding the project um, and, and go forward from that. The only one thing I, I didn't notice is, the, you know, as far as any um, efficiency in the building or any, uh, you know, green initiatives to the building, I didn't see anything listed, and it's just a matter of questioning what you want to do to get a building that's going to be very efficient and it's going to function very well for you and save money in your operating cost on a long run. That's the only thing I didn't see listed, which it's not really a concern. It's just another, another thing to add. To I don't remember that. seeing a parking lot for the golf course. See, that was a concern of mine. There's, there's sufficient parking. It, it depends on what diagram you're looking at. Yeah. But the one we did present to town meeting, there was a parking lot up back of the facility. Okay. No. I, I don't think I saw that. But. <laughs> A little more than cram, but not much more. <laughs> is, that the one, is, is that the one that shoved the public safety way off? <laughs> Mr. Lyons. Uh, just one follow-up question out, um, from Rob. You said you brought the uh, cost estimator into a later time. Is that at 60% drawing or before? You know, I'd like to defer to Mary on the, uh, the state is we usually start looking at, co at, at budgeting pretty much to all phases of the project. Um, I would suspect with the, des the schematic design, we'll immediately, you know, once we get involved and find out whether the schematic design you have, you know, is pretty solid, um, you know, we would probably look into do a, a cost estimate or a budget check on what you've done. Um, I, I'll put the front of Mary when exactly we put the cost estimate down, but usually about construction document phase is a good time for that we would review yours right away and then we do a, um, I think you actually called out two estimates that you're gonna want in design development and before CDs obviously the only exact estimate is the final construction bid estimate um, but we would we would do as many as, as you needed but I know that we definitely do at least two with our own um, third-party estimator and and because I'll move the cost estimating for the building, I think Mary is is very very good in tracking you know all of the town costs that might be involved in this. You have you know FF and &E, which is fixed to furnished and equipment, and this with a public safety building you have a lot of equipment, a lot of technologies, um, you know printing costs or whatever. She does a very good job, you know as as, as a firm, um, in just outlining all the costs that are involved with a project, lining up what they do and tracking them through and seeing. What savings could be involved because you know the building construction cost is only a portion of it you still have a lot of other costs that are involved that we'd want to track and we'd, we'd track those all the way through from initially when we got on if, when we get on board you know what you've accounted for and what you haven't and then work with you you know so the cost down the line is in line with what you're thinking so um, I want to give the chiefs any opportunity you have any questions or town administrator <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, I just had a follow-up for Mary. Um, you attended the Chief of Police Conference and received um, certif certified training in the planning, uh, design, and construction of police facilities. Have you done the same for fire facilities? 
Uh, no, the only one I could find was at a casino, and it was, <laughs> and it was. A I guess it all depends. Yeah, I know. Um, no, the the one that I found wasn't as intense as this. This um, was led by the the benefit of this one, and I'm hoping they do have one for fire chiefs someday. The tours were led by the chiefs themselves, and as they walked through the buildings that they had just done, they said, "I would never do this again," or "This was the best thing we did." Um, so other than only, you know, I'm currently working with my own town in Blackstone. We're trying to get a public safety going. I've been working with Chief Sweeney pretty closely. So that's my, my touch there. Okay, thank you. I did see one in North Carolina that was done recently that wasn't in a casino, but yeah. uh, addressed a lot of the issues and concerns with fire facilities. Yeah, there aren't that many up this way, and um, I have spoken to a couple of firms, including Castle Blues, about running one up here. Great, thank you. Thanks. Chief Paulus? Just a quick question, and, and I'm very impressed that you touched on it, that you did go to that conference and you seem to be uh, up to speed on some of the concepts that have changed since the Holden Project. I just wanted to know who you might have for, a, let's say, um, a mentor, that who you would reach out to um, to make sure that those uh, things are touched on the way they should be during construction uh, to reach out to and, and make sure, probably on the police and the fire side, uh, to make sure that, you know, all the stuff is uh, being put in, it's cost effective and it's exactly what we need so we don't have to uh, come back to the town at a future date. Do you want me to? Okay, so I have my own in-house resources, obviously. <clears throat> um, and then the work that I'm doing with another firm in my own town where we're making sure all this is incorporated. Um, I don't know if it's Mike, Mike McKinnon. Possibly, I mean, yeah. at this point. I so we haven't really discussed bringing in a consultant for us, right? right? Because it's typically the architect's responsibility, and we're going to ensure that all these things that I brought up are in there and discuss with you and the other chief what things you actually want in there. And then we can, we can certainly entertain bringing in another consultant. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Do you want to? Well, I was just going to say that we... Our function as the OPM, we, we know that the difference between being the architect and the OPM, I mean, it's, uh, are, are important. We've designed fire and police stations, you know, and Mary has had special training and certification. Uh, but ultimately, our job is to assure that, number one, you are getting all the information you, you need. The architect should be qualified to design contemporary fire, police, emergency services building. Um, our, and our job is to is to see that, that that building is designed according to the program regulations and ultimately gets built that the town's the town's uh, um, gets its money with money's worth ultimately. Great, I think we're out of time. I just on behalf of the committee, thank you again. Echo some of the comments I already made. Thoughtfulness of your submission and your time thank tonight. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Good luck to you. Uh, with the committee's uh, permission, uh, I'd like to recommend a two-minute recess. Right. We're in recess.
All right, it's uh, 7.57 and I'll call the meeting back to order. Um, our third interview tonight, CMS Construction Monitoring Services, Inc. Um, gentlemen, just a brief outline of what we're doing with all, all the firms appearing before us. Uh, we'll give you about five minutes to introduce yourselves, your firm, and anything else you think is pertinent for us to know right off the bat. I uh, can assure you that this committee has fully read your proposal and spoken to references. Uh, that you've listed. Um, myself as chair will then direct about seven questions at you. Some may get combined based on answers, et cetera. Um, and then I'll open it up to the rest of um, the committee to ask you questions either based on things that they've seen in your proposal, things that have come out of the answers to your original questions, or other items we just have not touched on yet. Sound good to you? Excellent. Perfect. All right, and I know we are running slightly behind, uh, but we will give you the obviously the fully allotted time. So Thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, just as a matter of introductions, uh, my name is Neil Joyce. I've worked with CMS for uh, almost 10 years now. Um, I am proposed to be the project director on the job and I'm very excited and happy to represent CMS here tonight. To my right is Scott Lipker. Uh, he will be working with me in a project management role. And to my left is Paul Griffin. He is our senior partner and founding partner of CMS and he'll be working with us in an advisory role on the project. Um, we're located very geographically close. We're about 10 minutes away from the proposed site um, over in Marlboro. Uh, we've been in business at that location since roughly 1998, almost 20 years, um, exclusively in construction management and owner's project management services and public construction. Um, we're not designers. We don't present ourselves to be. We are your project managers. Um, the intent of the original statute was to provide uh, independent observation on behalf of the owner. Um, we feel as though we are the best representation of the true intent of that statute that's in the market today. We're, as I said, we're not designers, we're not engineers, we don't present ourselves as such. But we are your eyes and ears on the site, we're your eyes and ears watching the budget, and we treat every dollar like it's our own. We are incredibly passionate about what we do, and we truly hope and look forward to serving the town of Southboro on this project, as well as hopefully future projects to come. Paul, do you wanna add anything? No, I think that was well done. Well, thank you for the uh, opening. So um, in your proposal, we did not necessarily see a suggested project timeline, but um, based on everything you've seen, there's a lot of public information about the project. Um, can you just give us an idea of when you see the town um, putting shovels in the ground, how flexible you think that date is, and what you can do to accelerate it um, to compact the schedule? Well, I think that um, we would presume, it looks like you're pretty well along in terms of a schematic design. You've got a floor plan in place for the most part. You've got a site plan in place for the most part. Um, certainly there'll be some more detail and some development with that. I would assume somewhere between nine and 12 months for project design, I think would be certainly responsible. There may be some opportunity to improve that. Um, we always look at um, public outreach through um, the boards and the committees that represent the town like conservation and uh, Board of Health and uh, zoning, anything that may be required as part of the project. Um, and what we like to do is reach out to those committees early. As soon as we know that we're gonna need a variance or we're gonna need something from that committee, we like to go in informally, meet with them, explain to them what our needs are, ask them if they can uh, guide us or provide any assistance necessary to the architects to move the process along. And that way we find that that limits the number of uh, continuances and whatnot that happens during permitting. And that's always a place that projects can get hung up um, and, and can get stuck, if you will, is through that public permitting process. Um, and then in terms of construction, I think we tossed around 14 to 16 months, roughly. Um, we're doing another project uh, down in Hyannis, which is roughly the same amount of square footage, and that was the duration of time we assigned to that project, and it seems like it's doing well. Um, okay. Certainly proceeding mm -hmm. on or ahead of schedule there, so. Great. 
Uh, so if you were sitting on this side of the table um, and interviewing potential OPMs, what is the most important question you would ask of those companies? Uh, why don't I take a crack at that? Because um, believe it or not, I was the chairman of the high school building committee at Mashby. They didn't have a high school at the time. And um, I looked around at the members on my board. I had a teacher. Uh, I had a, two real estate people and uh, a cook, um, and they just gave us 30 million bucks. So, and I was the only one that knew anything about construction, so I, I pleaded with the state to allow us to hire an OPM. And at the time, uh, that was when they had the Department of Ed, not the MSBA they have today. And I convinced them, and it was amazing um, how, through the process, they were able to guide us. I think one of the things that I see looking from that, that window is that most of these people here are part-time, or I mean, are volunteers. And what I see in this industry is you, you, you really need a project management company that's gonna take responsibility for the project. By that means is that they're gonna be your eyes and ears out there, they're going to solve your problems, they're gonna manage not only the architect, but the contractor and all your secondary vendors that you're gonna hire, like furniture and equipment, um, and make sure that everything comes out. Um, my goal has always been with this company is to never bring a problem to this committee without solutions. And I think that by doing that is that we have to get on the phone, we have to have meetings with the, the team and continue to come up with it. To bring a problem here and not have the solution is, is, is crazy, it's just a waste of time. But I see it all the time. Um, when I started this firm, I started right after the Mashby High School based on this Jim Anderson who was in charge of this, the uh, school pro program there, kind of convinced me to do it. And it was interesting, there was no requirement for the first six years and I was so busy, it was unbelievable. I, and I didn't want to take more jobs that I could handle. I made a goal at that time that I was only gonna take 14 people and that's all I felt that we could manage at any one time. And luckily, we've had a very, very good successful rating. We have had only one project that came in late uh, and that was due to a bankruptcy late in the project over Avon uh, Mass, but we br still brought the pro every project in on time and under budget. And uh, I mean, that's our goal from, from day one we, I mean, it's all about managing the money. Okay, thank you. So based on your review of publicly available schematic design documents for this particular project, what do you view as the most challenging aspect of this project, and what do you view as your role specifically to make sure it does not become an obstacle in terms of project timeline and cost? Well, I don't know. I, I'll be honest with you. I looked at the drawings very carefully. Um, they've looked like, I mean, almost identical to the to station we're doing out at Hyannis. Um, I don't see any problems with getting this station up. The key thing that always concerns me is the rate of inflation between today and when you go to bid. If you take $20 million and you divide it, you add 5%, and then you divide it by 52 weeks, you, you'll start to see you got about 15,000 or more a week in inflation. The key for us is to get this thing designed and in the ground as fast as we can. Now, one of the things we did both in Hyannis, and, and I just convinced the architect about four months ago we did it in Dedham, was we put out early site packages. Because in both of those jobs, we had a site that had problems. And uh, so we put that package out early. We got it done so when we issued the contract, the next day he could start. He could start getting out there with his site equipment, start to lay out his building, and start digging foundations. That, that's a critical item. Give you an idea over at Denham, we convinced him to do it, and everybody thought I was crazy. Well, we ended up removing uh, 12,000 cubic yards of rock that we had a blast. And everybody kept on saying, oh, no, it's only six. Well, I kept on saying the pile looks a lot bigger than six. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it was. So it saved us like six months. 
Great. So along those lines, do you have any, so just, I guess, to clarify, Hyannis is fire only, correct? That's correct. Fire and rescue, yes. Okay. So along those lines, do you have any concerns about the, the cost that's been appropriated by town meeting, the design as you've seen it to date, um, or anything else you've seen in your review of the project that you think needs to be addressed sooner rather than later if you are OPM? Um, the, the building cost per square foot was roughly $450 a square foot based on the 36,000 square feet and change. Um, so I think that's a very responsible number in today's dollars. The question is, is what does that look like 12 months from now or so when you're actually putting the project on the street to bid? Um, so I think that's probably my biggest concern and that's something that anybody that's a, an estimator or worked in estimating or built a construction project or done a house renovation, that's something you have to manage and it's really outside of your hands. You can't control the market, you can't control um, external forces that affect pricing coming in. You just have to make sure that you keep those factors in mind. You do the very best you can to manage to budget during design. Um, we like to build in what I would call uh, bid contingencies like additive alternates, select pieces of the, of the project that are uh, maybe not absolutely mandatory but can be uh, added in if funds are sufficient and use those as um, measures to uh, save the project Save the project in the event that prices come in higher than expected on bid day. Okay. The site for the new facility presents us with a challenge in that the objective is to build a public safety facility on land currently being operated as a nine-hole golf course with the continuation, continuation of the golf course both pre- and post-construction. Do you have any experience with such an approach? If so, tell us about it. And also just give us your initial thoughts on how best to sequence these activities. Um, yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't see the golf course being a major problem because the plans I looked at, it's not going to be like landlocked in the middle. So yes, we'll have to fence around, and will we have to potentially put up some netting if we think that there's a uh, danger to the workers where balls would come in. But I've done a lot of jobs where we have had some very unique challenges. Uh, what, you know, several of them where we had to build a building next to a school, Concord. Example: We had 10 feet from the school that's operating to build a new one. We had the same challenge we had in uh, Burlington where they asked us the same, do the same thing. And then in both cases, we had to go and demo the building and, and convert it over to fields. And so you can imagine having something 10 feet away, I mean, you might as well say it's zero. But it got done and we just have to sit down and work with the team. Um, one, one of the biggest challenges I had in this industry is we were doing an addition at the uh, middle school in Danvers we were putting in the basement, we had a, it was a historical building, we had to cut it in half, and we were adding on to the back. We were at the last scoop of soil down around, I don't know, 20, 25 feet, and we scooped up black oil. So we had immediately, you know, sat to do some recovery because it was taken on groundwater. They would take it on frack tanks, uh, frack tanks at somewhere around a buck 50 a gallon. We immediately, within 48 hours, got our own cleaning station on site, reduced the cost to 25 cents. In the meantime, started working with uh, DEP to determine what we had to do. We ultimately, because we had a deadline when we had to get the school done, we immediately started focusing on the renovation of the existing portion of the buildings so that we could not lose any time. Believe it or not, we still finished the job on time and return $400,000 to the town, despite the fact we paid 700000 for the cleanup. Shifting gears a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, the town of Southboro has worked with Context Architecture, which is formerly known as Donovan Sweeney, mm -hmm. uh, for feasibility and schematic design. The Attorney General's Office has recently advised the town administrator that once the OPM is officially under contract, 
our committee can make decisions related to retaining context moving forward or going back out to bid. If you were selected as OPM, how would you propose running the process for deciding whether to retain context and or selecting and going back out to bid to select a new architectural firm? I'm going to take this at start. The first thing I would do is evaluate all the work that they've done to date. I would like to hear from the committee on and the, the two chiefs of what they feel the value has been to them up to now. The, I can give you the, the two-sided sword on this thing. One of you, is, you've spent a lot of time doing this study. They have a lot of valuable information. Unless there's some real issue with their services, I'll be honest with you, my strong opinion would be stay with this firm. They're a good firm. I don't know how they've been since they changed the name, but I mean, the, the history seems to be very well um, accepted in the industry, so I don't see that to be a major problem unless they haven't been performing. Now, I'm gonna give you another example. We have a job down at Westport. They had an architect, very similar situation. We got on board, and within six weeks, we called a meeting with the, the, the chief and the town administrators and the board, and we said, we think you've got a problem with this architect. I mean, every meeting was a fight with the chief and the administrators about what they wanted, and the architect continued to say, no, you really don't understand what you want. I mean, we realized it was a problem. Um, we immediately got a hold of the Attorney General. She said to us, no problem, go to the second bidder. We terminated the first guy. We got the second guy up and running within, within a month. two weeks. Yeah, a month, the most. And we still met this, the bidding schedule that the town wanted us to get. So, and I mean. The and the first guy was bankrupt four months later. <clears throat> so it was. A blessing. It really was. The job would have been a mess. I mean, we come out looking like heroes because we made the recommendation, but I didn't have any insight to that. All right, and our, my final question before I turn over the rest of uh, the committee is, what experience do you have integrating various aspects of technology into public safety buildings? What approaches have you taken in other public safety projects to find the appropriate resources to review this critical infrastructure and make sure it meets the needs now and into the future? Sure. Um, I think the first thing that we do is um, typically we structure our contracts so that the electrical contractor that's bidding the job 12 months before you're gonna put any technology in the building is responsible only for pathway, so conduit, back boxes, and structure within the building to provide the infrastructure for the future systems to be run. Then as you get closer to the, to the end of the project, you bring your technology vendors on, whether you utilize a state bid or whether you utilize a separate bid for um, or state contract, excuse me, or a separate bid for uh, technology and related services and bring them in as an independent contractor at the end under the direct guidance of either ourselves or the town at your discretion. Um, and what we found is, is, number one, that makes sure that we have all of the current equipment that's in. We're not specifying equipment that was old or was state-of-the-art a year ago. As we know, it changes very quickly. Um, it affords us a little bit of time to get into the building and look around and see how the building is going to come together and to manage all the different aspects of the technology. And it also provides you with an opportunity to get further into construction and know what your contingency is going to look like before you make decisions based on what level of technology you want to fund as part of the project. Um, it gives you flexibility both ways. You can either buy more or God forbid you're in a position that you need to buy less. Um, you have the infrastructure is in place so it can be added over time if you get into a crunch at the end of the job. It just brings a little bit more flexibility to the town and it gives you a little bit more time to evaluate different systems, evaluate different <coughs> um, approaches to the same thing and um, bringing the best solution forward to the, to the end users of the, of the facility. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the fire site that we're doing down at Hyannis. 
One of the things that um, we recommended to the committee is to set up a subcommittee of the chief and firefighters. It was amazing the information that the firefighters brought to the table. They have such a big, um, what do you say, brotherhood throughout the, the, uh, the country. Uh, most of them have gone to all of these seminars and they were, they were coming up with things, I'll be honest with you, that to some degree I'm still scratching my head whether or not it's gonna work. I mean, in theory, I've read all the data, it all seems to be right, but it'll be interesting. Like Neil said, one of the things we agreed to do is to put the infrastructure in, and then as we got to the nine month mark in construction, we would then sit down and become serious about purchasing what is the, the latest and the best items. To say that today, to go and agree to all of those items today would be would be crazy. I mean, by the time you get it, your you're, you're life cycle on that equipment's 50% out. Okay. So uh, for this round of questions, I'm gonna start right in the middle. Uh, Mr. Barry, I'm gonna work my way down this way and then loop back to the end of the table. Just trying to keep it fair to my committee hey, members sure. as well. Everyone will probably have us. at least one question. Yeah. We're gonna ask a, a one question slash maybe some follow-ups and hey, uh, here to go from there. Do whatever you want. So Mr. Barry. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I guess um, in this I wonder, I, I know that um, change orders seem to be a really big issue. Um, and I guess my question to you is, can you give me um, more examples of how you might uh, mitigate uh, change orders or experience with that, um, or maybe even averting, averting one altogether? Well, one of the pet peeves I've had since I started this business is that we review the drawings from the get-go till they're ready to go out to bid. And as part of that, we request on demand, however you want to put it, to the architect that we have a sit-down meeting at least twice towards the 70 to 90% range of the drawings with the en all the engineering team. And it's amazing the things we find. As I said, the school in Dedham we're doing, we just had our second meeting about 30 days ago and the architect says, no, I'm telling you, we got everything. We sat down and we, my list was over 50 items <coughs> that we found, which would have ultimately created change orders. Now, there, a lot of them wouldn't have been very much money, but it's still, it, it's, a, it's a process. Um, the other thing that I like to do is to allow us to do the second estimate for this project. Yeah, we charge an extra fee for that, but here's the advantage we get, is that Neil and uh, Kevin from my office are the chief estimators, and what they do is they look for every particular problem that they have finding the answer to the cost. Right away, if a bidder can't find that information, they're gonna need to do a change order. And that's the key for us to say, if he can't find it, then we need to ask the architect how and clear this item up. And we've done pretty good. I mean, our change orders overall have maintained, not counting owner ad, our unknown conditions, just errors of omission, basically under 1%. Um, and, and using your estimator, would you is that a, a kind of a one-time thing you do at the beginning of the project, or is that something you might do continually throughout the project? Well, it, it really depends on how you want to do it. We definitely recommend it at the 90% or 80% level, because that's the one that we need to make sure that we're okay. Now, we've had other communities that wanted to do it at the 60% as well. Here again, that really depends on how comfortable uh, we can recommend to you that we feel the drawings are and looking at the estimate feel comfortable that we can understand it and there's not a lot of items in there that are just guesses what we do when we if we're if we're selected as your OPM and we we receive an estimate from a cost estimating firm and there are a lot of very good ones out there don't get me wrong um, we look for words like allowances or um, estimated scope language that they'll put into the estimate and that to me is a red flag that that scope is not well defined they're carrying a lump sum of money for a scope of work that has yet to be drawn 
And that's what you really need to look for. If you don't see the number of allowances reduced as you get closer and closer to the finished documents, um, you know, you've got a problem that you need to address with your, with your design team. And they need to define what those are because general contractors don't carry allowances. They don't carry anything. And they put a big circle around it and they say, this is change order one. This is change order two. This is change order three. And it all needs to get defined and broken out and developed as the estimates go along. And I think just a, second, a secondary comment to what Paul said, I think that's really the value added that you get from us to do an estimate. Um, first of all, we always recommend that the architect does their own. Have them do their own estimate and they're good. We will do a check estimate, but it, it, provides, it provides you with the added level of security that we're looking at the documents for errors and omissions, for ambiguities, for other things. Whereas the, the architect's estimator is not gonna provide you with that service. They're gonna give you a number based on a responsible allowance for scope that's not well defined. And you're, you're really at risk as to whether or not it is really that number or whether it's much higher or much lower. Scott, thank you. So we've heard 5% more than once as far as what to use for inflation year over year in your business, in the construction business. Why is it 5% when overall inflation is so much lower? Why is, is, why is 5% uh, the right number, at least today? I think the, the hardest part of comparing um, escalation to um, sort of commodity pricing and cost of living and, and things like that is that there's really no competition in cost of living. So you can't take into account um, somebody else is trying to get your 3%, if you will. What happens is when the market, there's, there's, there's a pool of bidders that are available in public construction throughout the Commonwealth. If you drive through Boston today, there's buildings going up everywhere. Um, less so in Southborough, admittedly. But the, the problem is, is that they start to drain the resources. When they start to drain the resources, particularly in the filed subtrades, they get a little more selective about what jobs they're gonna bid. Fewer bidders means less competition, less competition means higher prices. That's the piece of it that uh, looking at escalation and looking at cost of living doesn't really balance out because you, you can't, it's hard to quantify who's gonna show up on bid day and who's gonna really sharpen their pencil. Is that, that depends on how much work they have, whether they have the slot available, and whether this particular project is attractive to that firm. That's the hardest variable to really get your hands on when you're putting an estimate together. So the only way to compensate for that is to be conservative. I think 5% is a very conservative number. We're seeing numbers getting close to that. We haven't seen 5% yet, but we're getting close. And that tells me that the market is starting to get saturated and it's very, very busy. Um, we've had, just as a, as a comparison, we've had a couple of jobs that we have in design now. We're calling surveyors to come out and survey lots and give us setbacks and, and whatnot. And they're telling us, hey listen, it's gonna be 30 days before I can get out there. So if that's the type of market that's there and what's out there, it's incredibly busy right now. And that's, that's what we're hedging against when we, go, when we come in at 5%, is, is the ability of the trade and the ability of the job to be competitively bid. And we rely on that competition to keep the pricing in, in check. Just to give you an idea, I uh, call one of the largest contract, electric contracts on the East Coast, uh, I don't know, 30, no, 60, 90 days ago, because I, I like you, a scratch in my head, and what he said to me is that overall materials have not seen an increase, maybe two, three percent. He said where he's getting hammered is in the labor. He said in order to get enough people, he has to pay them more. And he has to steal them from other people. He says sometimes I'm stealing a guy 20% over what I typically would pay a guy. And that's what's happening. Okay, I buy that. Mr. Kidney. 
What do you see uh, in, during this project as the largest obstacle that you may have to overcome? Hmm. The largest obstacle. Well, I think that, I mean, <coughs> I think there's two, two in, one in, in each category. I think that getting the architect to keep his feet to the, to the, on the fire and keep him going and getting the job out out of his office with the minimum amount of errors is probably the first critical thing. And so you have to look at it that way. I mean, we, you know, we don't even worry about construction. It's how can we get the best set of documents out in the least amount of time? Because time is money. The second issue is who are we gonna get for contractors? As you all know, uh, luckily this job is over the threshold uh, so we will have to do a pre-qualification. But the standards on pre-qualification, the way the state has it, I mean, has left some big holes. And so it can be very difficult to disqualify someone. But I can t honestly tell you we have probably disqualified more than most OPMs because we just want to do it. Now, have some of them taken us into the Attorney General? Yeah. A couple of times we got overturned by the Attorney General. We said, okay, fine, we just put them on the bidding list. But then when you get the contractors, you've got to make sure you put their feet to the fire. Uh, on one of our jobs, the architect was trying to insist on using his, what I, we call front end, the general conditions and the contract, uh, AA 101 and AA 201. And uh, so I wrote a memo off to the town attorney who had approved those documents outlining all of the problems I saw with the documents and that I suggested we go with the modified version of this and he sent me back a thing he said no good call absolutely he's I'll tell the town we're going to use this the reason being is if you don't have a strong contract you, you're certainly not going to get a good contract I don't care who they are if, if you have left them with enough room that they can slip through those cracks they're all going to take it They'll find every yep. one of them. Case in point, I had a guy that I knew very well. I call him up. He says, how come you didn't bid this job? You told me excited. He says, oh, I looked at the drawings. He says, that was so good. He says, I'd never make any money. He was looking for the extras. Mm -hmm. and, and I hate to tell you, there's a lot of those guys out there. And uh, so it, it's a matter of really how well and how diligent we are or any OPM to manage the job. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna look at every time they send an RFI, is there a potential cost? And why is that RFI in there? And are we looking at it to make sure that the right answer comes out that doesn't add cost? Because as soon as that architect publishes that, if there's any inference to extra work, you're gonna have to pay for it. So that's the problem. And so it, it's a matter of doing that. And then when you get the change order, or the, the the PCO, which is the potential. project, yeah, potential uh, change order cost, you have to go and analyze that cost. The contract says they have to charge us cost plus a percentage. I can tell you right now, you'll see that m most of the guys in this field, when they know that I have the job, start scratching their head because they know that I'm gonna check every one of the cost. I mean, if, if you have a piece of conduit, you can't charge me $10 if I know I can go down myself and buy it for $5. It's not going to happen. We're just going to deny it. And we're going you know, to force them to continue to do the work, and we'll just settle up with them later. Now, one of the things that we have, I pride ourselves on, out of 50 some odd projects that we've done in the Commonwealth, and some of them are really good size, uh, 50, 60. We had one in, in Danvers, $83 million. We've never had to go to court. We've always found a way to find a solution or to prove to them that their cost was wrong. And most of the time, if we can put our cards on the table and they can see they're not gonna win, they're not gonna spend money on legal. But I can honestly tell you, it's hard, it's work. I mean, we're a small firm. Uh, the profits, you see where the profits go. We don't have to send a lot of money up upstairs to corporate office or marketing. We're the marketing guy, and I'm going to be the guy that's going to change my clothes and jump in the trench if I had to. 
So the thing is, is that we put every dollar we get from an owner into managing these jobs. And if you check our references, they'll tell you. We'll be out there in the rain, the snow, we don't care. If, if that job's gonna, needs our attention, we're gonna be there. Mr. Lyons. Um, just a quick question. I, I have experience in building a police station um, and we had two underperforming uh, file sub bidders. At what point do you believe, like as the owners, you would recommend those subcontractors being let go to, you know, recommend it to the general contractor? They're basically delaying the timeline. Okay, I guess I didn't understand the question. So we, we had two, con you know, the uh, site contractor and yep. the finished carpentry were underperforming right. on several occasions. When do you as a firm like recommend firing them? I think the first thing we always look at is um, how timely are they with preparing their submittals? How timely are they and how accurate are the shop drawings that they're gonna fabricate to and from? Um, for site work contractors, we look at you know, how deep does he have more equipment? Is this his entire fleet that's on site? You, know, you sort of have to measure them based on what their evaluation is. Um, the good thing about the two cases that you've presented is that actually neither of those trades are filed. They're actually all under the control of the general Change contractor. General so it, it, it's actually um, much easier. easier for them <laughs> to deal with that problem than if it was a filed sub-bidder. Um, but if it was a filed sub-bidder, they are signatory and responsible to all of the terms of the general conditions that are in the front end of the contract. So as, as Paul's previous comments were, it reverts back to the strength of the contract. And if they fall behind, and if they are delaying the job, and if it is beyond a reasonable doubt that is the case, it compels the general contractor to take action or if they don't, you can certainly invoke their bond and have their insurance company step in. It would, it would, to me, it would symbol that they have lost control of the job if they're afraid to approach a non-performing contractor regardless of the nature of their contract. Um, and it puts the town at risk. So I think you would have every, every right under the terms of your bond to call, the, to call the surety and say, hey, listen, I think we got a problem here. Now we're giving you the simple answer. You can imagine it's going to take multiple hours to get to that. Um, just recently in the Hyannis project, I won't tell you who the contractor is, they brought in a new superintendent because the other guy they were supposed to bring ultimately got another job for a better deal. So we said, okay. He was on the job two weeks. I called up the owners. I told them to get down on my trailer for the job meeting. After the job meeting, I told them, I said, look at this guy ain't going to make it. I'm, we're putting you on notice now. I'll do it verbally. I'll do it in writing. Which do you want? And so, uh, believe it or not, they ultimately had a meeting in their office. This was Thursday. I got a call Saturday around 4 o'clock saying that after a lengthy review of it, they agreed. And so they terminated it. Now, we did a similar thing up in Hoppington where we, different position, it was the project manager for the company. We could see that he was not doing his job. He was not getting the document, like Neil said, not getting the shop drawings in, the, co uh, the uh, coordination drawings were not coming in. We found that uh, several of the subs were not on board with the schedule and the events to happen. And we ultimately forced the contractor to terminate that guy and bring on a new guy. And so for the last year, it's been much better. Mr. Rooney. And thank you for uh, coming in this evening. Um, you're in the service industry, and we want to make sure that we're going to be your most important client. And in looking at your organ organizational chart, it appears, Scott, that you're going to be the project manager slash project representative, is, I, which I suspect is a similar uh, clerk of the works it used to be called. Can you tell us a little bit, Scott, about you and your experience in, in doing sure. project managing? I, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but we haven't heard from you, man. If you're going <laughs> to yeah, be no. the guy ultimately with the so-called hammer at the scene, I'd like yeah. to hear a little bit from you. So I kind of do like a dual role with like, as a clerk and a project manager. We call it like an on-site representative, mm -hmm. um, project manager, on-site project manager. And, um, um, you know, like, like, like I said, dual role. Um, you know, I'll be doing the clerk's role and then I'll also be um, managing the budget and um, um, 
you know, going to all the uh, construction meetings, mm -hmm. at the, the job meetings, the committee meetings, um, um, working with Neil on the estimate um, from the beginning. Um, you know, I'll, usually what I'll do, me and Kevin will do the uh, the on-screen takeoffs, and then we'll give which, that Which is what, on, I'm not sure what just that the, we're, we're just reviewing the plans, doing the full takeoffs, so all the quantities, everything from the drawings. Got it. Giving it to Neil for him to um, put mm -hmm. the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. Get into a daily event, though, Neil, I, I mean, Kevin, Scott. Yeah. So, obviously, daily, daily activities are um, 7 to 3.30 or whatever as needed um, for regular construction activities. Um, we'll do a daily report. Um, we're gonna do uh, quality control. Um, we're gonna be checking submittals. We're gonna be just checking in with the subs, getting manpower, um, checking in what uh, materials are coming in and going out. There's uh, equipment going in and going out. Um, I'm, I'm I'm assuming you probably are familiar with the clerk's role and stuff like that. I, if not, I can go more into it. But well, I, I, I call, used to call it, maybe maybe I'm just dating myself, the, the clerk of the works. Maybe yeah, it's not right. called that anymore, but essentially no, it's the same there function. Still is. I mean, de depending on the project and the size of the project, sometimes we'll hire a separate clerk of the works, Like, and I wouldn't I wouldn't. Would you expect to do it in this project? Yes. You would? Yeah. A separate clerk? No, no, no. I would. You I would, would do it? Okay. Yeah. And uh, my, I, I'm just finishing up in Hudson. Uh, it's a 25,000 square foot facility. Yeah. Combination police and DPW. Um, we've worked with the contractor once previously in Sudbury. I was the on-site PM there as well. And um, both jobs have been very smooth. Um, came in on time, on budget, good quality. And um, like I said, we're just closing out Hudson now. We have the police uh, cut over date on the 25th, so we're just kind of gearing up with that. Today I met with some movers to, um, you know, just to check contents at the police station, the existing facility, and, you know, went through, you know, that that whole effort. And uh, we're just getting geared up to move them in next, a week from tomorrow. Great. To start, so. And, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with, public safety, police, and fire, and all the technology that goes into it, and you know what kind of spaces these guys um, need, and you know so when the architect's on board, um, you know I'll be able to input, uh, you know s whether the spaces are appropriate or not, mm -hmm. and whatnot when they're doing the programming. Great, so. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think there's one piece of that 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 you didn't really touch on, which I think is a very important role, is that you want to build a relationship with the contractor. Right, right. You want to present yourselves as a construction professional, if you will, um, that you're knowledgeable, that you understand what he's trying to do, and that you're in it together so that everybody is successful. I mean, that's really the true measure of a good project is when everybody wins at the end. Mm -hmm. So you, you put yourself in that position and you put somebody like Scott or another representative on site who can build that relationship with the contractor and build, if you will, a mutual trust between them. That although you're, the, the end goal may be different, he's trying to maximize his profitability, we're trying to get the most that we can for you. In the end, you'll find that common ground mm -hmm. and, and you'll pull everything together very nicely as opposed to drawing a line in the sand and saying, mm -hmm. okay, you stay on that side, I'm on this side, and you know, mm -hmm. it, it becomes very adversarial very quickly because of the divergent um, mm -hmm. goals that are unfortunately somewhat imposed upon right. by public bidding. Um, <coughs> but I would just offer that uh, just a, a softer side, if you will, of the clerk of the works rather than interpretation and plans and specs mm -hmm. is to build that relationship with the contractor, get him vested, get him on board, make sure that he's completely and 100% um, focused on the completion of this project and not worried about other projects elsewhere. This is this is his job and we're gonna drive him to that end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Wood, before you, um, in fairness to the other firms, we are pretty much, we have about approximately one minute. I'm not, okay. uh, <laughs> so I didn't know, Mr. Wood, Mr. Moorhead, if you have any pressing questions that have just not been answered in this session? Yeah. I have a small one. Okay, go for it. 
I didn't see it in here, and I apologize if you touched on it earlier. Do you have any competing projects that may pull your time away from here? Because like John said, every client wants to feel like we're your own client. That will be finishing up or running around the same time? No, when we go and put in a proposal, the first thing we look at is how does that fit our workload? Uh, we've never taken more work than I can get these guys to do and I can manage to make sure that we're getting everything we can. So the answer to that question, because I know you're out of time, is no. But I could go on and on, but. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Moorhead, anything? Chief. I'm sorry, I have no comment. I have no, no question. Right. Thank Chief Paulus. Just very quickly, I saw in your portfolio that you were responsible for the Foxborough project, which uh, the quote was, came out exceptionally well. So I expected to hear a little bit more about your experience there, seeing as how that would probably be the project that you've worked on that's maybe the closest to what we're looking at. So very quickly. Well, don't forget, Foxborough was now, what, 10, 14 years ago. And the one thing that I, I think the user was very happy, but I can honestly tell you the method of construction that was designed by the architect would, was not something that I felt strongly about because I don't know if you knew that we had a storm and the trusses blew down uh, because they were all aluminum light frame trusses. Uh, you know, on a station like that, it's a, it's a public safety building. I, I think you need to build it so it's rugged, so it can absorb a storm. But overall, yes, they were very happy with the building. I don't think they know the insides, but uh, here again, we, we were being forced to meet a budget. The town says, we don't really care. We just got to get it done for this amount of money. So that's what we did. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. I uh, appreciate not only the time and effort that went into the proposal, but the time here tonight um, and your detailed and thorough answers. Okay, thank, very thank good. you. Thank you. We do have a, a parting gift, oh, yeah. if you will. <laughs> it's just a, a sample of our equipment uh, report. I knew you were tight to time. Members in favor of moving to the fourth interview? Yes. Okay. Chief, do we have our fourth participant? Yeah. Holding up all right? No pizza? No coffee? <laughs> no, not at all.
right, gentlemen. So uh, you are our fourth yes. um, participant tonight, and um, just a very high-level overview of how we've run all the others and sure. run it consistently with you is uh, we'll give you about five minutes to introduce yourselves, your firm, and anything else you think are important for us to know. Sure. Um, I, as the chair, will then direct about seven prepared questions that all the other firms before you have already answered. Sure. Um, and then what we'll do is we will uh, go committee member by committee member if they'll have an opportunity to ask any questions um, based on anything you submitted in your proposal or likewise items they just want clarification on. Um, we've had a really good flow back and forth. Um, we'll keep you to about 45 minutes. We did take a few quick breaks in between some of the interviews. So appreciate you hanging in there and starting so late. Well, we appreciate uh, you hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that said, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you very quickly. Just give sure. us some introductions and anything else you'd like us to know about you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Kevin Heffernan. I would be the PM mm -hmm. on this project. I've been with Vertex for over 18 years now. Uh, we, Vertex has been a company that's been uh, in business since 1995. We're an ESOP, uh, we're an employee owned company, so who you get are the people that's gonna be on this team as well as the ones who own the company as well, so we take a very large vested interest in how this project performs, because like you all know, uh, you're only as good as your last project. I'm also the chairman of my town's high school building committee. I'm also a town meeting member and a member of the various uh, committees in town, so I know exactly what you guys are going through right now, so I, I share your sympathy. Um, this is Steve Theron. I'll turn over to Steve. Sure. I'm, I'm Steve Theron, a resident in town here. Um, I was the chairman of the school building committee for the uh, Woodward School project, so I know the, the real estate there very well. Uh, also, at the same time as that project uh, was the Trotier Additions project. I also was the uh, appointment for the town on the, uh, on the vocational school building committee, the sole representative from the town of Southborough on that committee. That just wrapped up after a five-year stint on that committee to do the project over there. Uh, John Lemieux is our project director. He's not here with us tonight. He's actually in Appalachia on a uh, habitat-like project with his daughter down there this week. So uh, with the scheduling, uh, John was not able to be here, but that's what he is off doing. So, Also, we're a full-service consulting firm. We're able to bring in environmental specialists if needed, not that we're offering up that type of service, it's just somebody that we have in our back pocket in case we find something on the job site that we might be able to take care of quicker than we would have to by waiting to get an engineer or somebody else involved as well. Um, I guess basically, we'll turn it back over to you for any questions that you have. Great, thank you for the introduction and uh, in case I forget to say it at the end, I'll say it now. I just wanted to pre appreciate the time you spent sure. putting together the proposal and obviously the time you're, you're spending here with us tonight. So going right into the proposal, our committee has spent a lot of time studying your proposal as well as others. Um, you submitted an estimated timeline, which for the benefit of those that don't have that, um, was approximately a start date of April of 2018, shovels in the ground in terms of construction. Yes. Um, how flexible do you view that timeline? What areas can be accelerated if needed? And do you see any risks to that timeline? Well, so, some of those things that we could possibly make up for is how quickly this committee is going to make a decision on the OPM and then how quickly we're going to turn around. Are we going to deal with contacts as being the architectural firm that we're going to move forward with or are we going to go through the whole entire process of going out and bidding for an, getting a new brand new designer? So that's some areas where we might be able to make up because contacts already has previously done your study. We've had the options. We've seen the options that were presented before you. So again, we'd like to look at that option right there. But again, it does seem realistic that we might be able to make up some time with pushing the architect and the contractor to making sure that the project is done on a timely basis. Great. So if you were sitting on our side of the table, oh, yeah. which you seem to have experience doing that, um, and interviewing potential OPMs, what is the most important question that you would ask of those companies? For me personally, and I'll let Steve answer, for me personally is what, how, how are you able to rectify a problem situation? I mean, every, every, no, no job unfortunately goes completely smoothly. So how are, they, how are you able to deal with a situation that came up, whether it be the architect, whether it be the contractor, how are we able to rectify the situation, how will we be able to involve all parties to make uh, the correct decision that benefited the town? So I guess the question I would be asking from that side of the table to the OPM would be, what was the best, what, what were some of the problem areas that you ran into on a project, such as this size or this location, and how were you able to fix it? So 
coupled with that is specific project experience because what you want to have is somebody that's been through the same kinds of issues that you're going to run into on this type of project this isn't a school building this isn't you know whatever other kind of building it's a very specific and complex use with the residents and inside the the communication systems that are inside that are to be within the building and also go outside the building and coordinating all that and having specific experience with that couple with the problem solving that Kevin mentioned great thank you so based on your review of publicly available schematic design documents for this specific project what do you view as the most challenging aspect of the project and what do you view your specific role as making sure it does not become an obstacle in terms of the project timeline or cost so I have a couple thoughts I was delighted to see that the location of the Woodward School septic system was identified instead of not realized so that's good because that would be an unfortunate surprise so move, moving that down over to the other side, I assume that field will, will be for both buildings, but I'm not, not certain of that. I didn't study that. Um, the, the general layout with the two stories uh, is just like the project that we just cleaned up and, and finished and opened this spring in situ. It uh, happens to be flipped uh, in that building. The police were upstairs and the fire were downstairs. But similar setup with the EOC there, the single dispatch, the single uh, fitness and equipment and all that, all that was similar. Uh, so to me, that looks good, though site work is, is going to be the critical component here because uh, with the grading issues that you have uh, out toward the back, there's opportunities to look at that and study that to see what might be the best way to go about it. But the, the floor plans uh, that, that are out there, those have been done and they work. Okay. Along those lines, um, a little broader of a question, based on the review of those same documents, and I realize there's only so much that you can do, um, without having conversations back and forth. Do you have any concerns about the project cost design or other factors that you've seen thus far in your review that, that you feel need to be addressed sooner rather than later? Uh, the, the only one that I would be very concerned about would be the site, the soil, making sure everything is suitable to be putting up a structure in, on that site. Obviously, you're taking those two buildings that are being occupied right now and we're gonna transfer all the equipment and the men into brand new buildings. But for us, for, for my personal experience, on fire stations that I've been building, police stations, it's always about the soil when you're putting onto a new location. We didn't do enough borings. That was usually the answer is enough borings weren't done. And unfortunately, we hit a spine that was unsuitable. So you're taking that out. Also, for me, I mean, we looked at the budget. We feel very comfortable. The project is well within the budget. Uh, you have a healthy contingency. Uh, you're, in that, you're in that little gray area of 128 and 495. But I think you're far enough away from 128 where you're going to get good pricing. Um, like, like on a project we're doing right now, Littleton Fire Station, they came in, they saved some money. Westford also came in under the budget. Uh, the high school project I'm working right now came in under the budget. So right now there are a lot of people that are hungry. Uh, if we, you know, as, as you go on, the escalation, which we thought was going to be high, came in much lower because there are a lot of companies that really want this business. And this being a $22 million job, um, we would be looking at to pre-qualifying all the subs coming in. That, that's a process that we would take care of for you. But again, it, it involves taking the right contractor to do the job for you. Okay. Just because I know some committee members will ask that, what do you view the right escalation in percentages? Usually it's 4%, but right, right now it seems to be hovering just a little bit below that. We've seen it previous years where it's been 10 11%. But you know, for the last couple of projects that we've been working on, the escalation seems to have plateaued, and it's not really picking up right now. Okay. So um, to the site itself, mm -hmm. um, it presents us with a challenge of where we have an, a dual objective. We're trying to build a public safety building on land that's currently being operated as a nine-hole golf course. Very nice. With the continuation of the golf course during and after the construction. Do you have any experience with such an approach? If so, tell us about it and also give us any initial thoughts on how to best sequence this project to achieve this dual objective. I can speak to that. I mean, just when we built the septic system where it is right now, we did that. We had to take over part of the golf course, build a system that's there right now, and then give that property back to the golf course so they could continue on with, the, with their ongoing play. In, that, in this sense, though, it, it is similar to some school projects I've been involved in. I've done, for example, in the town of Norwood, we, we built a new school 15 feet away from the existing school. So we dealt with all the uh, challenges of trying to build that close to an ongoing school and an ongoing operation. I'd like to think that's harder than working with the golf uh, situation, just all the, the safety concerns that are there. So 
so we work with that kind of issue, you know, on, on most projects actually. For some of the jobs that we've done, like the Randolph Police and Fire Station, uh, we, we had to work very closely to operating facilities. In Littleton, uh, it's a manned station. We had to relocate the entire fire department to a location down the road. In Randolph, the police station was occupied 24-7, so they never left. So we phased that project out. So when we would finish a phase of, this, of the job, that we would talk with the police chief, we'd move in certain officers into a certain area, and we would swap. And that, that it was all about communication with the entire team. So what I would do personally with the golf course is get them involved right away. What do you need? Where, where do you have to set up? Because this is, we have to find out a lay down area for the contractor where he's gonna put all his equipment. Where we're gonna do the excavations, where we're gonna put all the soil on site. How, we gonna, how is that gonna interrupt part of the nine hole golf course? And see with them how we can actually work together to get it done, but keeping them uh, informed of the process throughout the entire time, for me has always been, communication has always been key keeping everybody informed as to what we're gonna do, how it could affect someone else, putting whatever that type of information that we need to on the website for the town possibly, if you're gonna inform neighbors, because we have to tie into the road as well for water and gas. How is that gonna affect the, the traffic patterns as well? And you know, updating everybody, all, all, all the vested interest in the project. What is going to affect the next person down the road? Don't think about it when it happens. Think about it so you can plan for it properly. And like Steve said, uh, the projects, a lot of stuff that we do, we're building a high school too, it's only 10 feet away from each other. How is that gonna affect the kids that are in there? This is an operation, this, this guy's making money, he wants to keep his operation going, so we just wanna make sure that we don't interfere and take him out of circulation and business totally. But he also has to understand we're working with the chiefs and trying to build a brand new station with you guys as well. What's gonna take precedent and how we get that all done together? Uh, slightly different change of pace. Town of Southboro has worked with Context Architecture, formerly known as Donovan Sweeney, for feasibility and schematic design. The Attorney General's Office has recently advised the Town Administrator that once an OPM is officially under contract, our committee can make a decision to retain Context moving forward or go back out to bid. If you were selected as OPM, how would you propose running the process to either make a decision to retain Context or select a architectural firm? Well, f fortunately for us, we're doing three jobs with them right now, and they're actually very, very good. So I, I like the way that they work. Um, but I would advise you, if, if that's the, to keep the job moving forward, if we, if we had a really tight timeline, and we all doing the background check of context, we find out that they're a good fit for everybody, and ha are there any concerns from the committee, first of all? Has there been anything that's come up that you guys might say, I'm not really 100% sure about them, then I'd say if you're not 100% sure about the person that you're about to do business with in this size project, I would advise you then maybe we should go out to bid it. But other than that, we have worked with them before. We've been on projects. We've, we'll talk to other towns for other projects that they've worked on to see what issues have come up. And we'll do that relatively quickly. Uh, if you choose the OPM tomorrow, we're making phone calls. What's today? Monday? We're making phone calls on Wednesday just to find out how that process went. How did they do previously for their other clients. Okay, great. And my final question before I turn over the rest of the committee is, um, what experience do you have integrating the various aspects of technology into public safety buildings? What approaches have you taken in other public safety projects to find the appropriate resources to ensure that this critical infrastructure meets today and the future standards? Well, that, that's very, very important because like Steve had said before, a police fire station is very, very unique they're not like any other building that you're gonna to put together. So we would talk, we would sit down right away with the chiefs and say, who do you have for your communication right now? Are we bringing over a radio tower? What type of communication system are we gonna have inside the station? Is it dual communication for both fire and police? Talk to them about what type of radio systems that they need to operate for the entire town. And um, we've done that with an EOC as well as combined dispatch on several projects that we've worked on. But again, it's getting an understanding from the chiefs of what they need in order to build this facility, but for future use. Uh, I, I don't want to build a, f a building that's going to be outdated in five years. So what extra material? Most of the time it's conduit. Just putting conduit yeah. in now for future generations in order if I want to run wide. It's a lot easier to run a conduit today and spend how many it is for a linear foot of plastic conduit 
than it is to tear up ceilings and walls later on to run it. I'm a high, very big believer in put in now. You might not use it for a long time, but there's that opportunity. You might just need it. Let's just have it in there. Plus, it's cheap money now. But the communication is a unique animal, and the consoles and purchasing their equipment in Littleton and in Randolph and in Westford, we're working with the chiefs. What's your console? Who's your communication guy? And we figure out who those people are, and we make sure that if the chief is very comfortable with a certain vendor, we use that vendor. And we, we take that out of the con contract with the electrician. And the electrician might just run all the pipe up to a certain point, and then we take it from there. But it's working, getting understanding from the chiefs. That's exactly what they need. Okay. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the committee. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Moorhead. Do I get two questions in? Um, <laughs> so you guys, you guys get to last, so I missed my last one. Um, we, we're aware that we may want to do an early package on this, but we're also aware that the project's all under file sub bid. So how can, we, how can we do that, and can you talk to that process of doing an early package with the, with the same contractor that will ultimately do the building? And, but how, how would we do that process with an early package, which could happen this year or, or early next year before the documents are out for the, for the so building? We can both speak to that. Yeah. So first, we'd, we'd have a good discussion to understand why you want to have an early package. And, and if it's schedule-driven and, and that's what's driving it, then it can be a very advantageous thing to do, no, no question about it. Um, Chapter 149 doesn't really let you do that. Chapter 149A, CMA risk, does let you do that, and Kevin's doing all, well, lots of that. He's the, the chairman of the building committee in, in Bill Rico, and there, what's the, what's the value of that project? Um, $176 million. $176 million high school project. So um, early packages allow you to get one item out there as you, uh, and, and have that make a decision in the procurement of that early package as you then create a guaranteed maximum price for GMP that gets submitted by the, by the CM at risk and under one, chapter 149A. There are advantages and disadvantages to each program. 149 doesn't really let you do the early package. It doesn't let you, not doesn't really, it doesn't let you do that. 149A does let you do that. There are other advantages. Uh, MSBA has come out with a, stand, uh, a study that they've conducted over the past several years, data over the past several years has said uh, 149A is great, but it is more expensive almost every single time. So you have to figure out what your priorities are. If it's an early package and schedule is the, is the pressure cooker, then that's a great way to, to respond to that because maybe that's I don't want to say more important, but more of a driver than, than a little bit of cost. So you'd have to have a good discussion about all the advantages and disadvantages of each. So Chelmsford Fire Station, perfect example of what you're just talking about right now. We went out with an early site package. We gave it to a different contractor just to save money. And we, we were very fortunate that when, when the bids came back in, we saved a tremendous amount of money. We were able to work with the contractor, the GC who got the fire station project, we tied in all the lines where they were supposed to be. Again, it's a process of, if we're working very closely with that site contractor, and we're getting to the point where we wanna make sure with the engineers and the architects know where all the connection points are gonna be. So you don't, you don't wanna have a, a, a puzzle game going on trying to figure out where everything went. So we went with an early site package for the Chelmsford Fire Station. We did all the parking around the, the location. We did spots for footings. We did early uh, sewer and everything else taking care of all that. So when the contractor came in, and again, that was tied into an existing town hall. So that had to be occupied the entire time. So again, we phased it where we did a little over here to benefit us in the end. And then we went and we attacked how we were gonna connect the two buildings together while leaving town hall completely operational. So th th that, that's a great question. And again, like Steve said, if we were time driven and you really wanted to go out early and start doing all this work now, I'm, I'm all for it, let's go. Because there, there are great benefits to it. But again, it's like everything else, there's a little bit of risk. But you know, I think you'd be fine because it's a golf course. You're not, it's, it's not a, um, yes, it's occupied 24 seven, not 24 seven, but seven days a week, people are playing golf there. But if you're gonna start to build that, we get the, the owner of the golf course informed right away, this is what we're gonna do. We start staking it all out and you're doing your borings real quick so we know we have any type of unsuitable soils that we got to deal with. So I hope that answers your yep. question. Thank you. Mr. Wood? Did you have another one? No, I was going to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Giving the chair flack. Oh, oh, here we go. Nice. I so, too. 
You're the only one that on your depth chart said uh, that you may need staff backup or replacement need during the project. Um, do you have any upcoming projects that will be competing with ours around the same time? I know if John were here, I know how he answers this question. He says, if God forbid we're allowing Steve to have a day off, we got somebody else who's ready to, to be on the job for that day who's qualified as well. So th that's more what that is about than, than anything else. It's a good solid bench uh, is the way that- John How often do you use your bench? Well, I try to get a couple of weeks a year, but. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there is that, that, you know, that moment when people take vacation right. and everything right. else, and we, we're able to do that. But we have a couple of projects right now. Littleton mm -hmm. will be finished in December. Uh, Westford will be finished around the time you, you're ready to go out. So that's two clerks that we have right. who have full-time fire department experience that will be coming off those jobs that could jump into this right away. I'm available right now. Uh, this, is, this is all I do. I do fire stations and police stations from New York City all the way up to here. Um, this is what I've been doing for the last 18 years, and we're ready to go right now. So we have plenty of people as backup. Yes, I'm going away next week, so I'm sorry if you guys <laughs> want to start going. I'm going to be with his John will be phone. back. <laughs> but John will be back and everything else. And the way that we usually do it is you'll see John in the beginning, you know, with negotiation and everything else, and then I'll come in and it'll be me dealing full-time with the chiefs and everybody else and giving presentations to you guys, updates to you guys as, and any other committee that you want us to. So that's how we would, we work it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mr. Rooney. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, uh, both for coming in and in particular for your patience. Uh, in looking at the materials you submitted, I found to be the most relevant, the situate uh, development, the, this public safety complex, uh, in which, Stephen, you're listed as, as a uh, principal in that. Yes. In that. Um, and as I understand it, you came in and took over for uh, a, another OPM. That's right. Uh, if I were to call the town administrator and, and ask her about your performance and how um, you managed that project, what would be your opinion as to what she would say? She would say it was a great decision that they made to take that project away from another OPM that they have in town who was doing other school projects in town exactly why they did that I don't know but I know that they were delighted with the way that project went and the experience that that, that we had in, in bringing the leadership to that project yeah and that's almost almost identical just so you know what she said because I did speak Otis. with her and uh, she said you were exceptionally responsive throughout the project she could not speak higher more highly of you and in particular the the uh, on-site clerk of the work so whether we choose you or not I this evening, I just want to make sure you leave here with at least some feeling of, of, of happiness. But you, d you did, she, she, she did say, she did say exactly, exactly what I said. So See, thank so you, you very much. you can go through town the rest of the time knowing that you did something well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rooney, Mr. Lyons, Mr. Goodney. Um, what do you see as a lot, get the shift gears there. What do you see as the largest concern or obstacle with the project? Yeah, so a couple things. What, and this is perhaps an answer to a few questions and in, in to me because it's so important. One thing that we brought to the Situate project is, is two different commissioning consultants. One is an envelope commissioning agent and the other is, I think more, most importantly, is, a, is a, unless you have leaks, then the envelope is more important, is the mechanical commissioning agent. And what the mechanical commissioning agent does is they take all the systems, whether it's the, the, the next gen 911 system or the, uh, the uh, whatever, fresh air system in this component, all the different systems that are all communicating with each other and they test every single solitary thing in the entire building to make sure it all works. Because these systems, every building that gets built, they're even more sophisticated and certainly far more sophisticated than any building in town because no building would be as new as this building in town here. So getting the building so that it works well and, and works Every system works, every system com communicates with, with the systems they're supposed to communicate with, and everybody that's in charge of the building knows how to operate the building. I know that years ago here, when, when Trottier opened, we had to go back and spend more money to fix systems that never worked. I know that happened because I ran the second part. That's when I started in, in, on the building committee here. Um, so to me, the mechanical commissioning, that's an area that in, in, just in the, in the industry, which I've been in my whole career, is least understood by most of the people on the project, is how all those systems work, and if they're not working, what do you do about it? So to me, making sure all the systems work and people actually know how to run them on the, on the building is, is an incredibly important component of the building. 
everything's important, but making sure everything works and know, people know how to use them is critical. For me, it's the uh, backup systems and also the communication, yep. because with, with the, the radio towers that are needed, you, you don't want to be prepared to open up a fire station or a police station and you have no communications. And you got to make sure, like, like we said before, if something was to go down, I mean, this, this area gets hit pretty good with snowstorms and everything else. So you want to make sure you have a system that's operational 24-7, even in the event of an emergency. How do we make sure that all of our systems stay up? So it's getting discussions between the engineers and the contractors as to how we're going to hand off the communication of the dispatch center, how we're going to hand off the, dis the, the, the wiring for the towers and everything else. And again, making sure that, like Steve had said, that the chief he, he doesn't work 24-7. He, he lets the other guys take over when they got to take over. How are they going to maintain that? Do we have a facilities department in town? And if we do, who's going to be at the training for all of these things? Because some of the times we have towns that will just be like, just videotape it. That's fine. No, don't worry about it. But nobody knows how the systems work. So we videotape, and we actually we pretty much beg everybody, get the, the heads of the departments involved right away. Because DPW is somehow, some way is going to be involved in this project whether it being taking off some soil or helping us out one way or another, we get them involved as well. And now you're going to be doing a lot of stuff with the state because you're going to be tying into the yep. road. You're talking about a traffic signal as well. Mm -hmm. Those things take time. They're not something that will go like that and I can call up National Grid or call anybody and they're going to respond tomorrow. That never happens. I don't, we have guys tell us all the time, oh, I have a contact. I know somebody. Okay, you do know somebody. Guess what? That somebody's on vacation this week. He's not answering any of our calls. So what we try to do is we start to pluck out the things that we've had problems before in the past. And one of the things about Vertex that we didn't talk about is we got our start with taking over troubled projects, uh, um, jobs where contractors were, were removed from the site, and we've come in. How does that help us here? It, I'm not saying that your project's going to be in trouble. All we're saying is we've been able to identify problem jobs so we try to steer very clear away from all of those and make sure the job goes as smooth as possible. Ms. Cook? So just as a point of clarification, we're going to own the golf course. Um, so it's not somebody okay. else that we will own it with the land swap the same works. So Steve, um, you, you brought Trottier up several times. So what did we do wrong with Trottier? Why did that? Why did that building end up with so many problems that still persist today? What could we have? What should we have done differently since you were on that committee? So the industry has adopted the commissioning agent trade, and that didn't exist before. So that's a specialty group that's out there. That that's what they focus on, and they're better at it than anybody else on the job. So. Neither the, the envelope commissioning agent nor the on, uh, mechanical commissioning agent that didn't exist before. Um, starting um, about seven or eight years ago, it might be longer than that, uh, a project I did in Norwood, we brought in the mechanical commissioning agent, MSBA pays for that. We brought in envelope as well. Since that time, the MSBA, Mass School Building Authority, sorry for using the abbreviations, they pay for that now as a standard part of their projects they pay for those two commissioning agents to do their thing because it's so important to the ultimate value of the building to make sure everything's working right. So that didn't exist in those days. You didn't have somebody with that expertise on the job to be able to check every single thing and make, it, make sure it all worked. You'd get a report, like a, a, uh, uh, a report on, on how all the diffusers are working, if everything's blowing out the proper air, you'd get that report on the balancing report and they'll say that this diffuser is, is pumping out this sort of CFM in fact, it isn't even, the power isn't even brought to the unit yet. But that's what the report said, that it was providing this much output of CFM. So those are the kinds of things that, that did happen <coughs> in the industry, but they don't happen, it probably does, but not nearly like it used to because of these, these uh, commissioning agents, both on envelope and mechanical. Okay, so it's not gonna happen again to us. No. Okay. It, it, these guys, it, it's funny, the, the clerk in, in situate, um, she didn't have a project with a mechanical commissioning agent before, and, and as I was working with her to generate the scope of work uh, that we used to then go purchase those services, what I assured her was, I know this is a pain and you're focused on other things, but believe me, this is going to be your best friend come the end of the project, and that's exactly how it worked out, because that person knew everything about the building, and that's how it works today, and it's industry standard today. Mr. Barry? Do you, um, I'm trying to 
I think. <laughs> I have a question if you want to. Yes, I, I'll pass. Um, I might have missed this. It might, it might be just because you're the fourth. Is um, Who are we going to see in the near term? If you were the OPM, who would we see representing us during the design phase, especially at conservation, planning, board meetings, et cetera? And then who are you proposing as uh, clerk of the works if we were to engage for that? I'm just trying to match the proposal versus what you put in front of us, and they don't tie. And, 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 and also as a supplement to that, could we also uh, make recommendations or urge uh, as to who we would like for the clerk of the works based upon we, prior feedback? We, but, we, would, we would propose individuals to be the clerk. One would be Brian Fors, one would be William Nagel. They're the ones who, that are doing Littleton and Westford. They're also the ones that have done Randolph. Okay, uh, for full time, it would be myself. You'd see me all the time. You'd see John in the beginning as the project executive, but I would be the project manager. It would be me all the way through, including from the start of design all the way to the end. And then the clerk would take over on a field day-to-day -day operations. Together, the clerk and I, we work together to be your eyes and your ears on the job. You guys all have full-time jobs. It's our job to make sure that this job runs smoothly. But like I said before, you've met me tonight. Hopefully, it went well. But uh, <laughs> as far as the other ones go, we wouldn't surprise you. We would bring you an interview so you guys could sit down in front of, and they could sit down in front of you and meet with the, uh, the group, the committee, and whatever you need. That's how we like to present it. So just to confirm, on average, and I know no week is the same, how many hours do you see dedicating to this project? And I get that you do police and fire, and mm -hmm. like for example, Littleton may be off the table come December, mm -hmm. but like how many projects do you see having going on at a time for yourself in your role? Um, and then follow up to Steve is, how exactly do you play into the, the picture what, here and the proposed what, team? What, what we do, Steve takes care of the constructability that we have back in the office. So we have a team of guys in the office well, all they do is review drawings, making sure everything lines up together. So that's Steve's role as far as constructability goes. As far as the clerk would go, it's a 40-hour uh, full-time uh, process. As far as I'm concerned, we're usually between 8 and 12 hours. I like to see how the project's progressing. If there's more time needed, then absolutely. I'm not that far away up the road. I come down. I would also be the one that would present before committees if you needed that, whether it be the Board of Selectmen, whether it be this committee, whether it be... Um, town meeting, whatever you need, that would be my job. And again, it, it says, I like to get fully involved in what's going on because uh, I come from a family of police officers in New York City. So like I, I, like I said in a previous interview, my dad's on me like white right on rice. He's always watching what I'm doing because he was a, a lieutenant in New York City and he's always like, make sure you do right by the guys. And I have uncles who are in the FDNY, so it's a pride thing with us, making sure everybody, but again, like to answer your question, I'm about eight to 12 hours could be up to 20 hours, depending on what we feel the activity is being performed and how the meetings are going with the designer and the art and the contractors as well. But we would, I would participate every week in the construction meetings as well. Okay. Mr. Perry, did you have anything further? All right, Chiefs, Town Administrator. All right, is there any further questions from the committee? All right, gentlemen, nice thank you. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Oh, no problem. I appreciate you guys hanging in there yourselves. And again, John is available to uh, come and meet you guys as soon as he's back from Appalachia. Okay. So you guys need that to happen. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, take care, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. So we are uh, at three hours of interviews later. Uh, we've now been presented with four uh, candidates. Um, our agenda does contemplate discussion and a possible vote. 
Um, I think we've just taken in three hours of in-depth, well-prepared candidates um, that have thought through. Um, I'm open to any conversation that this committee wants to have. Um, I would say, though, that given the amount of time that the uh, candidate firms have put into this, I do think we owe it some time to just sink in um, and not make a um, decision unless there is just something that someone wants to bring forward um, for this committee to take action on. Um, we do not need to take any action in, until 6.30 next Tuesday night where we're scheduled to appear before the Board of Selectmen to make a recommendation. Uh, we're gonna have to pr provide a, one firm to be brought forward for negotiations, but we should have a backup list of how we rank one through four just in case the negotiations uh, do not work out for whatever reason. So um, that's my personal opinion, but I am only um, one of eight persons sitting up here and one of seven votes. So um, I will um, turn it over to anyone that wants to provide any thoughts on how we, we move forward. But I think my personal recommendation is that we can have any discussion you wanna have right now, but we table any vote until next Tuesday night uh, in advance of the BOS meeting. Mr. Rooney. Yeah, I, uh, I generally av uh, agree with you, Jason, but in this instance, I, I would be prepared to vote this evening, at least in my mind. Uh, one of the candidates stood out well beyond the other three, and I don't need any additional time, nor would any additional time cause me to, to uh, change the way that I vote. And uh, I just think at least the way that I saw it in the presentations and the responsiveness to the answers, to me, there, there's at least one clear choice, so I don't need the extra time. Oh, that, that's that's fair. Um, before you list that firm, is I didn't any, want. I wasn't going to yeah. list it. Is yeah. there anyone else that feels as strongly as Mr. Rooney does about one particular firm? Yes. Okay. I have one too, but I don't know who to make second. Just make sure you guys put your mics on. Yeah. Just say that one more time. Um, I'm strong on the uh, top candidate. I, I just don't know how to rank, rank the others. Okay. Is there any other strong feedback? So for those that are indecisive currently, uh, would it benefit to hear some discussion and thoughts so that you can further contemplate uh, your decisions? Would that be helpful? Yes. I'm seeing a lot of head nods. So um, I'll start with Mr. Rooney and Mr. Wood. You, you both feel very strongly. I'll save my comments for the end until everyone's gotten a chance. Just to name the firm that we're talking I, about? I think you have to. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, um, I just think you should outline why you think they stood out in your mind amongst the others. So I don't know which one you want to start. I'll st can I say it's my, it's what number of choice it is? Do you want that, or do you just want me to say these are my top two, and why? You said you felt strong about right. one firm. So my I'd number like one is uh, is Vertex. I was very I was very impressed. First off, he was the only one that came in with the lower escalation escalation rates. Um, he's already got experience with Dunham and Sweeney. They've got experience. Steve's already worked at Woodward. He's familiar with the with the land over there. I like their personality. Um, Steve's a resident. He's also a taxpayer. He doesn't want to go overboard on how much this costs. I like them a lot. So that was my number one choice. I also liked, I was torn between that and Lemaru Pagano because I like that they're a small firm. I think we're a big fish for them. I think they're gonna work really hard for us. And I, I think they do a good job. So those are my top two, but I really like Vertex and I'd, I'd vote for them right now if we went to a vote. Okay, Mr. So Rooney. Before I heard Vertex, I was very much in favor of Pagano. Before I heard Vertex, I was very, very much in favor of Pergano as term, more of a custom type of firm in terms of, listen, you know what, you are our client. You are our most important client. She was at our preliminary meeting. They did a lot of due diligence. Uh, and, and you know what, the, the, the proverbial glove really fit with them. So I was very persuaded by them. And uh, I, I was prepared to m make the same type of motion um, uh, or with same type of thought uh, after all of them with regards to them until I heard Vertex. And for the, the, reasons, the reasons that John mentioned, um, in terms of you know, their, Steve's familiarity with it, 
but also, again, I was the one who checked the references, um, and the references back at Situate for, for building the exact same type of facility, a police fire facility, almost for the same amount of money, 18.5 million, it was close, um, uh, and, and the most recent work as well. So, and him being a, uh, that's all they do is build police and fire stations. I, to me, it, it wasn't even close based upon the, their interviewing skills. The other, the other firms I had issues with, I don't know if you want me to get into the issues in case someone maybe perhaps uh, uh, is, is leaning towards those other firms, but in, in particular, the, the, the firm right before Vertex, when, when I asked the, the, the project representative or clerk of the works to you know, let us hear him speak a little bit about his day-to-day -day activities, what he would be doing, he would be our representative at the site. I just, I wasn't convinced that he would be the right fit for the town. Um, so that, that to me was a major red flag. With regards to a day list, the very first presentation, um, I thought they were just a little bit too big for us, a little too polished, uh, a little bit um, like, yeah, well, we, you know what, well, we just want another notch in our belt with you, and yeah, we're gonna service you as the, as the client. I just didn't get the feeling that we would be their most important client which I think is important. It's important for the golf course issues, it's important for the residents, and it's important for the town that we get someone that fits really tight with us. And these last two gentlemen, uh, although they su suggested a clerk of the works, which is very different than the clerk of the works that the town administrator from Situate uh, urged me to have them recommend, but maybe that would be a discussion we would have further down the road. Uh, so just because I did vet on behalf of Chief Morrow, um, these, well, uh, Kevin, who's the project manager for Vertex, who's uh, working on Littleton now, which we completed in December, the clerk of the works that he did mention is Littleton's, and they were able to, the chief there specifically said, Kevin is the guy you want coming to your meetings, which I think is abundantly clear based on the presentation we just went through, and quite honestly, how efficient it was to get to the right. point. Um, but in addition, the clerk of the works he mentioned was the one that the Littleton Fire Chief was specifically able to say, um, save them at least 500K in site work uh, issues. They found a whole bunch of things underneath their old police and fire station. So I, I, I think the references are certainly right. corroborating each other. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, given the, at least our, my background, not really having any background in building a public safety facility, one of the most important considerations for me is to listen to those references, people who have experience with these people. And uh, speaking with the town administrator, uh, to me, uh, caused me to urge them to come in for the interview, but also I, 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 I kind of think they hit it out of the park at the interview process as well. And Jason, the only reason is I don't, I'm not gonna need any additional time. I, and. And, and maybe someone can try to convince me otherwise, but I, I think it's gonna be a hard sell. Mr. Lyons, you had a strong opinion? Yeah, um, I chose the Dalius. Um, I like the fact that they had the most experience in police and fire stations combined facilities. Uh, it seemed like they looked at the site, they were out there during their interview. I like the fact that they have their own budget estimators, that they can be on top of the cost at all times. And, um, just as a uh, second set of eyes when you have your own architect on staff to be able to review drawings and go over the uh, space needs and make sure they're being met by the chiefs. And uh, that's why I chose them number one. Those committee members that didn't feel as strongly, do you have any thoughts you wanna throw out there just for maybe those that felt more strongly about a candidate or where you're wrestling in? Well, I can tell you where I'm, I'm wrestling is, uh, I do like the fact that Adelius and Pagano w had architects that, that were not really paying for, we're getting that free service that they can, you know, they can validate the architect that we hire, whether their, their thoughts are valid or not. I also kind of like the bigger operations because when you do run into problems, you know, they can, you know, they can sink, you know, five cost estimators on a problem where a little, a, a little guy can't necessarily do that. I, I mean, I, I like the little guy. You know, you want to give him the business, but, you know, when, when it really comes down to who's going to be the best overall, I think sometimes the bigger companies have more resources and more horsepower, so to speak, to, you know, that, that can solve problems. You know, they, they, 
you know, they can solve problems, you know, very quickly, where some of the little ones just can't necessarily do that. So I am kind of tossed. Um, I must say that um, I, I, back when I was the chairman of the uh, Municipal Facilities Committee 10 years ago, Steve did attend a lot of our meetings way back when we were trying to do the, uh, you know, public safety, public safety complex on the old site. Um, he was at a lot of the meetings. He did give us a lot of feedback. He was very uh, engaged and, and you know, he wants to do right by the town. There's, there's no doubt there. So I am kind of, you know, tossed between the two. Um, certainly if Steve was working for one of those other companies, it would be no question, but um, he's not. So that's kind of where I am. Um, so just to clarify, which firms are you? I'm kind of, you know, I'm, 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 I'm tossed. Like you say, I'm going to have to think about it and uh, maybe somebody else will bring out some facts that maybe I didn't realize, but that's kind of where I, I do like the fact that we're getting, you know, free, almost like a free architect resource with those two companies. So how do you know it's free? Well, <laughs> true. You don't know until you negotiate, but um, at least they have it. They have, yeah, they have the ability to provide right. services. Right. We don't know right. free per hour or how they're going to bundle. Right. They may, they may say I'm worth more because I am an architect. I don't think you need to worry about an add-on cost. As she, both of the ladies were, are architects. Um, and so you've got an architect doing is your day-to-day -day person, so I, I think that you probably do get an architect. It, you do get two things in one with an extra cost, um, but I've got the same dilemma you do. Um, but I did exactly what John Rooney did. Oh my God, I thought the Vertex guys hit it out of the park and they by, were by far the stronger team mm -hmm. as far as who sat there. I thought no one had a strong <coughs> team other than them. I thought the two ladies were strong. Um, I didn't think anyone at the table with the third group were, was very strong. He talked over the other two people. He kept finishing their sentences, especially mm -hmm. So, you know, that's not what you need to do here. Let this guy talk. Um, but I thought, I mean, the fact that he lives here, he's worked on Woodward, I mean, they knew what they were talking about um, and seemed to work well together. And um, the fact that he said, you know, 4%, a little bit less, between 128, 495. I mean, he just really had very specific answers, and they looked at us in the eye. Those other guys kept looking down the whole night, right? These two kept looking at us and were very comfortable, so by far the better presenters, no doubt about it. So I did exactly what Mr. Rooney did. Um, started with thinking it was going to be LPA and then went to, to Vertex. So I think I'm kind of, um, I was blown away by Vertex as well. I think they're, um, I really felt most comfortable with them. Um, same thing, uh, John, you, you had listed all those things. Um, they're, you know, they're local, they're, um, uh, seemed very personable, um, seemed to say everything that, that needed to be said. Um, I guess my only hang up with them would be that they're a smaller firm um, and the data is, 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 seems big and um, they would probably be my second. I was impressed with them, but um, I think they'd be my second because um, primarily because they're so big and, and I don't know that we would get the same attention. Um, because they're big, I think uh, they would they could provide services that maybe smaller firms couldn't um, but there's also you have to I think the way we need to be careful of being swept under the rug too um, so I'm, I'm a little bit torn um, between the two but I think Veritex would be my my first uh, my first choice um, I to go with, so Mr. Moorhead I'm, I'm only torn because I think they're all very capable I'm, and like I said last week everybody that's going to show up is going to be technically a able to do this so we are hiring the personalities here. Um, and I do think Vertex, I think Kevin's got the personality that, you know, can come off brash, but he says all the right things. He he's, says it forcefully because he's right, probably. Um, and, I, and I think they do a great job. And I think LPA would be great as well. Um, and I do think there's an added benefit for this OPM to, to be a designer by trade. I mean, this, this, it grew out of our profession and just kind of, it migrated over there because it's a specialized enough that um, you know it, it's one man it's it's one person job, um, and I wouldn't get hung up on size because I don't think any of these sizes of these firms are anything outrageous that where we'll get better service one way or the other. We're going to get people that are dedicated to the job, um, so I, I don't think size worries me here. Um, I do like LPA and, and Vertex. Um, I think they're all going to be capable, but it's it's really what we're going to be comfortable with. Who we're working with, and I and I appreciate when they bring the people that is our day-to-day -day contact, because um, that's that's who we're looking at here. Um. 
Go ahead, Mr. Rooney. And Michael, what, when you say it grew out of this, uh, well, what, I mean, what do you this, mean by that? This, this the, the, OP, OPM position yeah. wasn't around 20 years ago, as you heard him, heard yeah. him say, um, because people would go ask for a designer to design the building, and they did, they just kind of truck along and, and do it. Um, and as you as you heard, and it's probably what happened with Trottier, that there wasn't somebody really watching everything going on. And so, you know, a, a bid would come out or something, and maybe somebody wasn't involved or knew enough of what was going on. So it just it, it morphed into this position, full-time position. Um, and so while I, I appreciate the idea that there's somebody here showing up who could be an OPM, they, they're not coming from that background. Um, but the, I don't think it's a bad thing. Can, can I ask Mike another question, Jason? Go for it. Is the importance of uh, the uh, in-house architect or architect uh, experience uh, at the OPM that was mentioned by, by John in your experience? Um, First of all, I don't have a ton of municipal I know experience that, yeah. where, so my OPMs are usually somebody who's really watching those peanuts. You know, they're watching those those beans. Um, so I, I don't, I haven't had an experience of an OPM being a designer. Um, but with LPA, they're, they're still in the profession. They are still right. designing buildings, and they're also doing the OPA, OPA OPM work. And I, I didn't ask, but I get the impression that Mary's probably the OPM, and then these are the architects that mm -hmm. she brings along. So, so she's going to be kind of the conductor um, in her, in their house, and then as our representative. And as she needs help, she'll go get it. Um, so, I, so I think it's a great setup. And it sounds like with De Dallas, um, what's her name? Um, Alicia, she'd be the PM, but she's an architect as well. So it's um, again, it's. A, Take it for what it is, right? It's, it's, yeah, I'm it's just a good thing or a bad thing. It's a good thing. The issue that John brought up, because I think it's a good issue that, you know, they have the architect experience. Yeah, we're not getting anything for free here, right? We're, we're, we're getting the service. It just well, happens to come from I an architect. I know what I might do, and you guys might not like this, but take a second look at the schematic and see if there's something that they, based on all the other ones they've done, that we shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what it is. Um, so that's what I thought the value might be, where the guys who are strictly um, um, construction managers wouldn't necessarily weigh in on that wouldn't, type wouldn't of thing. Wouldn't bother, right? right? And none of them said anything, right? None of them said, had any major, con major concerns coming out of no, their initial review. No, but you know, review. the guys that did um, um, Foxborough, he said he knew that it was built of less than great materials. Well, then why didn't you get it changed, you know? It fell down. Yeah, so that they was kind of a... tried to, and they wouldn't let them do yeah. it. Yeah, so that... Well, he didn't sound like he said a whole lot, but he just, it is what they wanted. They wanted it, that's what they wanted. They wanted it built on time, and they wanted this, but so, okay, whatever. But that's one thing you want, you want them to say something about. So, I just wanted to offer my opinion, because I've <laughs> tried to sit here silently, um, is I echo Mr. Rooney's opening 100%. Um, I thought before Vertex sat down in front of us that, Lamaro Pagano was the right fit for the town. Um, but then when Vertex backed up those references during their interview, um, and we're talking about multiple different people, right? right? Like it was a unique, just how we decided, how we vetted. Um, I honestly think we cannot go wrong with either of those two firms. Um, I quite honestly, and I try, hopefully didn't show it on my face, but um, my opening question to Daedalus, which we, basically telegraphed last week at our meeting um, about the timeline, the fact that they didn't know that the town had appropriated funding for this, all one has to do is enter into a Google search, Southboro Public Safety, and you'll see plenty of people holding the yellow cards at town meeting. So um, while I believe we have a very large project and we need someone of substance that's done these facilities before, the reason I would not advance them particularly um, would just be the fact that they may be too big and not looking at the peanuts and the details, um, because that's a pretty big detail to miss um, up front. I do think they have tremendous experience. So um, I am definitely leaning the Vertex way. I do not think we could go wrong with Lamar Pagano. Um, and I think CMS, uh, pales in comparison to the other three by quite a bit, given uh, exactly what Mr. Rooney said. Um, so I don't know if there's any other discussion that anyone wants to 
to throw out there tonight. I'm not seeing uh, a unanimous vote by any means. I'm seeing a lot of tired faces. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else that anyone wants to throw out there. I do think this is a very, very important decision because these are the people we're going to be working with for the next two to three years, hopefully closer to two, but it's probably closer to three. And um, I don't know that we should rush to a decision if there are people that are not comfortable making a decision. I'm hearing Mr. Rooney is ready to make a decision. Mr. Wood is ready to make a decision. I myself am ready to take a vote, um, but I'm not hearing anyone else ready to take a vote quite yet. I, I just think we have the process to sleep on it. I mean, that, that, that's, that's absolutely that's fine. Yeah. So um, with that, what I will propose is that this committee will reconvene at 530 on Tuesday the 18th, so a week from tomorrow. Um, in this room, I'll post a meeting tomorrow. Um, the sole purpose of that meeting uh, will be to discuss and vote on what you have slept on for the last seven, eight nights. Um, and I will be prepared to then stand up in front of the, the board at 6.30 or wherever we slot into their agenda um, to present um, who we plan to move forward with, but also articulate um, everything we've gone through in case they have not watched the almost four hours of footage you know, between uh, tonight and then obviously the other two, hour, two plus hours from the other night. Because I think it's also important to outline um, you know, how we got to the four that came before us tonight. Are there any other thoughts or considerations anyone wants to throw in? The chiefs yeah. want any, throw yeah. anything out there for us to think about or town administrator? So I think it was I think it was a good process. It was a lot of um, you know what what I expected in terms of the results. I think and, and I think along the same comments that Mr. Rooney made, um, yeah, I'm seeing things very similarly. The one thing with the committee is is that you either get hung up on or you don't want to get hung up on is redundancy. And when you talk about firms that have the architect. You know, how much redundancy do you want? You know, if you maintain your relationship with context or another architect, you have an architect. Um, you have a member on your committee, albeit not um, municipal work, you know, it is an architect. Well, and, um, I and I wouldn't be doing the in-depth drawing review that, we, that they would be doing. I understand, but, but, but still, you value, know, you, yeah. you've been able to, through this process, what I've seen from you is, you know, you're able to, you know, maintain a certain level of honesty you know, with Dunham and Sweeney and ask the questions that, that need to be asked that other members of the committee might not be able to ask them in such a way that, that you know, I'm not saying you put the architect on the spot, but, you know, they, they know you know what you're talking about. So I think, I think that's helpful. So it was just the redundancy issue that I think, you know, that the, the committee members who are still on the fence need to work through as to how important that may be. And, and to, to Jason's point, um, you know, nothing is free. Um, so there is, you know, there is a, a value to that service, which I think, you know, would probably be reflected in the bottom line for the OPM's, um, you know, cost. Thanks. Chiefs, do you have anything? Mr. Goodney, you had something? Yeah, I just wanted to discuss the, the actual person that we're going to have on a day-to-day -day basis, the 40-hour person. Now, is it my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, because we get a lot of information, I've been up of like two days. Alicia, who is is going to be that person 40 hours a week? No. She's a, no? no? Is that she's my she's understanding? She's, she's 30, a she, yeah, 30 Third? to 50 okay. percent, she the said. The clerk of the works is the person who's there. So, and time. we only met one of those tonight, and that was the oh. third person, the third, okay. Yes. And, and the clerk of the works is during construction. We're, we're, I think we're more important. We're, we're, we're better off looking at the PM, the project manager, okay. who is our 30 to 50 percent throughout design. And then throughout the, throughout the starting startup of construction, so the, the clerk of the works is on site. Okay. The, the PM is the person that we're doing we most of the communicating we, with. We're working with them really too much. The clerk of the works. Yeah. I mean, we're we're getting their reports. We're getting their feedback daily, on, a, on as construction's progressing. We're getting the PM's feedback weekly, 
um, okay. as as the project goes on, still through construction. So there are two different people. I, okay. I do think one thing to point out, though, to the point you're making, though, is, yeah, we only interviewed one clerk of the works right. now. Just when we hire a firm, we will have the opportunity, right, you know, when we question some of the teams of who they would bring, we want to look potentially at a firm that has a, a bench that this committee is who we want to work with, not necessarily one person that they've already boxed in because um, how do you know that person's going to be available in April? Right? Are they already budgeting out their schedule come April? Just something to consider is in the, the items we have in front of us, is there a bench or is there one option at that firm? Now, we could choose to separate the two is my understanding too and we could just hire someone to be our OPM and we could have a separate clerk of the works too. Um, so I don't think you're making necessarily a decision on Clerk of the Works next Tuesday. Yeah. You're making a decision on the folks that were in front of you and the firms that they represent in terms of what capabilities they bring to the table. Are we good? I'm good. That's why I asked the question. That, uh, that was a good question. <laughs> uh, any other commentary that anyone wants to bring forward for tonight? To the extent that anyone needs persuasion, and I understand that some people may need persuasion, one other thing that I wanted to mention about Vertex, which I did not mention, nor do I think anyone else mentioned, is that they seem to have a long and continuous and ongoing relationship with Dunham and Sweeney. And to the extent that this board continues on with that, those relationships are important, um, and uh, the relationship is already established. It's not as if they're going to have to work with a brand new entity. And uh, so that learning curve, to the extent there is a curve, is going to be very mild. So to against anyone, again, on the fence, if that's important, I just wanted to mention that as well. And now I'll get off my soapbox with regards to Vertex. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for that point. Any other discussion? Is there a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting is adjourned.